Captain America Civil War was the highest grossing movie of 2016 and a truly epic installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe franchise. It saw the Avengers split down the middle, as Cap and Iron Man's views on the Sokovia Accords conflicted with one another. As you would expect, it was also filled with Easter eggs, references, and the kind of intricate details that fans love to go in search of. In this video, we'll take you through 10 of the best examples of them that you may just have missed. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. It's the best way of keeping up to date with all of Screen Rant's great new videos. The only matter I do not take seriously, boy, is you. Your politics bore me. Damien Poitier one of the most memorable moments in the history of the Marvel Cinematic Universe came in the mid credit scene of 2012's The Avengers. The commander of the Chitauri army, known as The Other, was seen talking to a mystery overlord, who was sat on a large throne somewhere in the deepest and darkest reaches of space. Of course, that mystery overlord turned towards the camera and was revealed to be none other than Thanos. That prune-like purple chin was unmistakable, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe was turned on its head as a result. Back then, however, it wasn't Josh Brolin playing the Mad Titan. For that brief mid-credits cameo, a little-known actor called Damien Poitier portrayed him. In Captain America Civil War, Poitier returned to the MCU, this time as one of Brock Rumblow's mercenaries in the movie's early battle sequence in Lagos. But he was certainly easy to miss, as he didn't get much screen time. It was, however, a pretty cool nod to an actor who must obviously be disappointed that the character he originally brought to the big screen is now going to be played by someone else in what might just be the biggest film of all time. Margaret Carter was known to most as a founder of S.H.I.E.L.D., but I just knew her as Aunt Peggy. Sharon's Speech 2014's Captain America The Winter Soldier revealed that Peggy Carter was still alive, but being well into her 90s at the time was hanging on to this mortal coil for dear life. She was clearly at death's door, so it was no surprise to find out she had passed away in Captain America Civil War. Her off-screen death resulted in her on-screen funeral, where Steve Rogers finally learned what pretty much everybody else already knew, that Sharon Carter was her niece. In her touching eulogy for the lady she knew only as Aunt Peggy, Sharon quoted a philosophy that she learned from her her aunt, the founder of S.H.I.E.L.D., but it wasn't just any old eulogy written for the film. It was actually one that any true fan of Captain America should remember from the pages of 2007's Amazing Spider-Man 537, in which Cap delivered the exact same speech to Spider-Man. You remember, it's the one that goes, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say, no, you move. It's actually a passage written by Mark Twain, but Peggy apparently took credit for it anyway. Tell me, Becky. You've seen a great deal, haven't you? I don't want to talk about it. D23 as everybody knows, Marvel Studios is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company, and in essence, the movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe are actually Disney offerings. Disney have, of course, kept their iconic animated characters out of the MCU, but the studio isn't completely above the idea of using MCU movies for a little subliminal marketing. In Captain America Civil War, when Bucky Barnes was chased down, captured, and placed in containment, his holding cell had some pretty significant markings on it. To explain, the holding cell was apparently taken from Deck 23, with D and 23 placed prominently on the outside of it, and it was very purposefully facing the camera for most of the scene. While casual fans can be forgiven for failing to recognize the very clear reference to Disney's annual D23 event, those people who keenly attend it every year would most certainly have known what was going on. D23 is, in fact, the name of the official fan club for the Walt Disney Company, which was founded in 2009. But it's indeed known mainly for its biennial exposition event, the D23 Expo, where the studio's upcoming films are unveiled and detailed. Stop. The Winter Soldier Trigger Words In Captain America Civil War, Bucky Barnes was reactivated as the Winter Soldier by using a series of trigger words. The complete list was Longing, Rusted, 17, Daybreak, Furnace, 9, Benign, Homecoming, 1, and Freight Car. They may seem like a bunch of random words, but we think each one actually has a hidden meaning. Longing refers to the fact that Bucky is longing for the past, wanting to go back to a time before he was under Hydra's control. Rusted refers to what Bucky would be without Hydra, very old and near death, especially his metal arm. 17 refers to the year he was born, 1917. Daybreak is symbolic of Bucky's new life, being reborn as the Winter Soldier. 
Furnace is a little tricky, but it could refer to where Bucky would end up if he defected from Hydra or where his metal arm was forged. Nine refers to the number of heads the Hydra has in Greek mythology. Homecoming refers to Spider-Man Homecoming, with Civil War being the movie in which the webbed wonder was introduced in the MCU. One refers to Bucky being the first Winter Soldier, and Freight Car refers to the vehicle Bucky fell from in 2011's Captain America The First Avenger. Did you run facial recognition yet? What do I look like? Uh, I don't know. I've been picturing a redhead. You must be thinking of someone else. Friday the Redhead this particular Easter egg was delivered almost completely in passing when Tony Stark was chatting with his new AI, Friday, about what went down in Vienna in Captain America Civil War. Stark asked if Friday had run facial recognition on Helmut Zemo. After it was discovered, he was merely posing as psychiatrist Theo Broussard. The AI sarcastically replied by saying, What do I look like? as if to suggest it was a stupid question, because of course she's already done that. Seeing as Friday doesn't look like anything, Tony simply replied that he figured she was a redhead. Friday's response was to say that Stark must have been thinking of someone else, which in this case was probably his on-off girlfriend in the MCU, Pepper Potts. But for devout Marvel fans, it was also a cool reference to the comic books. In the comics, Friday is sometimes represented physically by a holographic projection, and the holographic projection in question really does have red hair. You can decide for yourself whether or not you think Civil War's writers did that intentionally, but it's pretty cool regardless of that if you're familiar with Friday from the source material. So what happened to the real Broussard? He was found dead in a Berlin hotel room, where police also found a wig and facial prosthesis approximating the appearance of one James Buchanan Barnes. The director cameo. So we just briefly referred to Theo Broussard in the previous entry, but this entry is all about him. Broussard was the psychiatrist hired by the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center to interrogate Bucky Barnes after the incident in Vienna in Captain America Civil War. But he was killed by Helmut Zemo, who proceeded to impersonate him and take advantage of that by using Hydra's trigger words to activate the Winter Soldier. Well, not long after Tony Stark had finished fighting against Captain America's anti-accords team at Stuttgart Airport, he received some crucial information from Friday that we referred to earlier regarding the fact that the power blackout and rampage of Bucky was no accident and that Zemo had planned it all, and that Broussard was lying dead in a bathtub at a Berlin hotel. At around that point in the movie, photographs and footage of Broussard's were shown, and they were actually footage and photographs of Joe Russo, one of the movie's directors. It wasn't Russo's first cameo in a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie that he had jointly directed with his brother Anthony. He had previously appeared as Nick Fury's personal physician in 2014's Captain America The Winter Soldier. So why is Michael so happy? because he's decided to never speak to these people again. The Stair Truck the Russo brothers really are completely owning the Marvel Cinematic Universe at this point. Having previously directed two brilliant movies in Captain America The Winter Soldier and Captain America Civil War, they're now directing this year's epic Avengers Infinity War and its as yet untitled 2019 sequel. But before they were blockbuster movie directors, the brothers got their major break into the television world with their work on the incredibly popular Fox series Arrested Development. The two were famously recruited to direct the pilot episode of the show back in 2003, which they used to set the tone of its now iconic offbeat comedy and family dynamics, and it deservedly won them an Emmy. Arrested Development's Bluth family may be a million miles away from being MCU heroes, but the Russo brothers made sure their presence was felt in Captain America Civil War. During the movie's memorable team battle sequence at Stuttgart Airport, the Bluth's one-of-a-kind vehicle could clearly be spotted parked up in the background. It was visible at the point when Ant-Man decided to pick up a miniaturized water truck to use as a projectile, and you can easily spot the unmistakable red, blue, and white paint job from a mile away. Quick, can you get him off me? Buckled in? Yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good, Arrow guy. Let's go, let's go! The Hawkeye Ant-Man team up. Scott Lang was like a star-struck little boy when he first met Steve Rogers after being recruited to join his team in Captain America Civil War. He got his words mixed up and shook the super soldier's hand for far too long, but once the fighting got underway, he proved in no uncertain terms how valuable his shrinking powers could be in a superhuman battle. The most daring and ambitious attack that he was a part of came with the help of Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, as Lang was fired skywards towards Iron Man at the tip of an arrow. It was an ingenious way of getting the tiny hero inside the armor in order for him to wreak havoc, but it wasn't something the writers of Captain America Civil War came up with. The idea was taken straight from the cover of 1982's The Avengers No. 223. Hawkeye and Ant-Man are very different characters in the movies to how they are in the comics, but the claim made on that issue's cover is indisputable even in the MCU. When Ant-Man and Hawkeye join forces, somebody's gonna get it. And on that occasion, it was poor old Tony Stark. He's my friend. So was I. Captain America vs. Iron Man 
The final fight between Captain America and Iron Man in Captain America Civil War was full of Easter eggs. The moment when Iron Man's repulsor blast hit Captain America's shield was clearly a nod to the Civil War graphic novel, where the exact image was used of the front cover. But there were some other major nods to their comic book battle. When Iron Man used his AI to analyze Cap's fighting pattern, it was definitely a direct nod to the on-panel version of the fight, because Tony Stark did exactly the same thing on that occasion in order to get the upper hand. Cap also knocked off Tony's helmet, which was very similar to what happened in the comics. There was also a nod to two moments from the first Captain America movie from 2011. When Cap was taking something of a beating from Iron Man, he stood up and said, I could do this all day. This was a direct reference to him saying those exact words during a fight against a bully in a New York back street prior to being injected with a super soldier serum, and when Red Skull was giving him a beating towards the end of the movie. The Futurist, gentlemen! The Futurist is here! The Futurist. When Captain America Civil War came to an end, most of Captain America's anti-registration team found themselves imprisoned in the superhuman prison known as The Raft. Sam Wilson, otherwise known as Falcon, Wanda Maximoff, otherwise known as the Scarlet Witch, Scott Lang, otherwise known as Ant-Man, and Clint Barton, otherwise known as Hawkeye, were all locked up for rebelling against the Sokovia Accords. Tony Stark decided to pay them a visit, but he wasn't exactly a welcome visitor. Stark was greeted with mock applause by Barton, who announced to his fellow inmates that the Futurist had arrived. The obvious thing to assume from those words was that he was taking a shot at Stark's ego, given that Stark claimed to know where the future was headed and what outcomes were most likely to happen, but it actually meant more than that. It was also a clever reference to the title of Robert Downey Jr.'s debut music album, which was released back in November of 2004. Futurist was a jazz and folk album that also featured a single with the same name that RDJ co-wrote, and it's actually pretty good, assuming you're into that kind of thing. If you need us, if you need me, I'll be there. Doctor Strange has a lot of secrets hidden up his sleeves and under his cloak of levitation, but the master of the mystic arts doesn't have nearly as many secrets as the easter eggs and references hidden throughout his first installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The movie, released in 2016, is still giving us much to think about in terms of the past, present, and future of the MCU. And while we all look forward to the coming of Avengers Infinity War, let's look back on this movie that's still providing fanboys with new Easter eggs to discover. Allow me to help you. And while you journey into the mystic realm with Dr. Stephen Strange, click on the red subscribe button to keep watching more videos stored away in Screen Rant's Sanctum Sanctorum. It's Groundhog Day! Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day is the classic Harold Ramis-directed movie in which Bill Murray plays a moderately well-known weatherman who is forced to relive the same day over and over again. Now, what does this have to do with your average Marvel movie other than Bill Murray's alter ego of a weatherman ending with the suffix man, you know, like other superheroes, like Spider-Man? Well, with Doctor Strange, our hero dares to study the forbidden mystical art of time travel and unlocks hidden talents that we hadn't yet seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. While Ant-Man got trippy with our concept of size, Doctor Strange stretches what we thought to be possible with time and space. And although the visual aspect of Doctor Strange's finale is one of a kind in the MCU, we've seen this type of storytelling device in, you guessed it, Groundhog Day. What the hell? It's obvious now, but it wasn't until fairly recently that eagle-eyed fans were able to make the connection between the 1993 comedy and the more recent MCU installment. When Stephen Strange's car crashes in the first act of the movie, his watch stops on February 2nd. Whether anyone noticed in theaters, it wasn't fully picked up by the general public until February 2018, when director Scott Derrickson confirmed on social media. Excelsior. Stan Lee. It wouldn't be a Marvel movie without a Stan Lee cameo, and while it's never a blink and you'll miss it performance, he's always there long enough to make an impression, but he never stays long enough to really make a dent in the story. We suppose that's a good thing, in that he's usually given something humorous to do. Are you Tony's stank? 
but he never distracts from the action at hand. Still, for a guy as likable and with as much of a connection to the material as Lee, you always hope he'll be given something fun to do. While his shining moment in Doctor Strange isn't anything more than innocent bystanders sitting on a bus while Strange and Mordo blow past them, his appearance comes with an easter egg that deepens the details of the Strangiverse. Here, Lee is holding a copy of Aldous Huxley's 1954 book, The Doors of Perception. While it may not be as well remembered to modern readers, Huxley's extended essay was a big influence on the counterculture that blossomed out of the 1960s, and its ideas on the capacity and potential of the human mind no doubt served as a big influence on Stan Lee and Steve Ditko as they developed and realized the world of Stephen Strange. Don't even find dead stick. Potential team up. Any superhero movie worth its weight in vibranium knows to toss in a throwaway reference to other heroes and storylines. It keeps the hardcore fans invested and usually goes unnoticed by casual viewers, and thus doesn't serve as a distraction. Basically, it helps more than it hurts. And when more casual fans look back on the older movies after watching later installments, they'll be enthralled by the hidden messages they may have missed. Maybe when we get to the Doctor Strange sequel or a future Avengers film, we'll all look back on the following reference with awe. Or maybe you'll just think, Duh, that was obvious. Well, regardless of your abilities to tell where the story is going, the scene leading up to his fateful car accident, where Doctor Strange is reviewing potential patients over his speakerphone, might be packed with more references than you originally thought. Turning them down as hopeless cases, Strange dismisses one possible surgical patient whose ailment sounds pretty familiar, a colonel in the US military whose spinal cord was damaged in an experimental armor slash battle suit accident. We all know James James Rhodey Rhodes was paralyzed after his mid-flight fall in Captain America Civil War. So could this be foreshadowing to a long-awaited strange Iron Man team-up? Let's wait and see. I see through you. Psychedelic Art with the counterculture in the 60s and 70s, pop culture finally caught up to a level of experimentation that the visual arts had already been exploring for years. Artists like Salvador Dali were expanding what we thought possible with perception and perspective, causing us to question what even constituted art. M.C. Escher's mathematical and measured out landscapes hurt the mind as viewers try to figure out what is up and what is down, and it's obvious that the crazy geometric shapes made by the folding and reflective cityscapes. You know, when the Ancient One takes Doctor Strange on a series of mind-bending training sessions through big cities. These graphically challenging masterpieces gave original artist Steve Ditko the inspiration he needed to find the visual tone of Doctor Strange's world and the mind-blowing dreamscapes of his trippy, mystic adventures. Teach me. Even after all these decades since Strange's very first appearance in the Strange Tales comic book series, director Scott Derrickson felt that Ditko's surreal artistry still hadn't been brought to life on the big screen. With his movie, he said, I don't think visual effects were ready to try and imitate him, but VFX finally caught up with Steve Ditko. Piper at the Gates while we're on the subject of trippy, the instrumentals and vocals of Pink Floyd do for music what Dali was doing for visual arts. It's a surreal rock that captures the thoughtful and explorational changes the music industry was going through in the 60s and 70s. Naturally, in the drive leading up to Doctor Strange's car crash that sets his character's journey in motion, we can hear Pink Floyd's Interstellar Overdrive, a song from their 1967 album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Doctor Strange actually served as inspiration for the band, with the character making a hidden appearance on their second album cover and being brought up in their song Cymbeline in the lyrics and Doctor Strange is always changing size. In keeping the Floyd and Marvel connection alive, Benedict Cumberbatch made a guest appearance at a concert hosted by guitarist David Gilmour a couple weeks before Doctor Strange's 2016 release date in which the star sang the band's hit song Comfortably Numb. And speaking of bands connected to the Sorcerer Supreme and vice versa, we mentioned previously that Stanley Lee's cameo featured his bystander character reading from Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. Well, for your information, the title of Huxley's work is from where the seminal 60s band The Doors got their name. We're not savages. Undeath and Undestruction 
When directing the movie, Scott Derrickson pulled a Spielberg, and just like when the latter was restoring E.T. for its anniversary re-release several years ago, he removed all the guns from the picture. Derrickson decided to craft a superhero movie that didn't feature guns in the frames. According to an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Derrickson stated that the purpose was more of a statement about superhero movies in general. Guns are usually an obstacle to a super-powered superhero. They're oftentimes one of the only ways an average human can get a leg up on our hero. But according to Derrickson, there's nothing less magical than a gun. Getting rid of any kind of traditional hardware was necessary to make it about more than destructiveness, which is a common theme within the action sequences and set pieces of the film. Dormammu, I come to bargain. The ending itself, through its use of time travel and slow motion, is more about rebuilding the city than it is about death and destruction, which is refreshing in a genre where most climaxes involve heroes attempting to stop planet-destroying weapons, planet-destroying beings, or planet-destroying planets. We're looking at you, the eventual appearance of Darkseid in a Superman movie coming to a theater near us several years from now, we hope. We will now receive the power to destroy the one who betrayed us. Mindless Ones when the villain, Caecilius, is sucked away towards the dark dimension, there's a chance you saw him and his henchmen transform into shadowy beings with beams of red light coming out of their eyes. Like some kind of dark version of Cyclops from X-Men, this was not some random side effect of the mystical world they were getting pulled into. This is likely their transformation into the Mindless Ones. Doctor Strange might have been able to defeat them in their old forms, but the Mindless Ones are known to be incredibly powerful entities with the ability to bring destruction wherever they go. Healing from the dark dimension, the mindless ones have a hefty center of gravity, allowing them to withstand most obstacles. They don't make much noise, which is all the more threatening as their sheer numbers overtake and overpower their enemies. Caecilius himself seems to become one of these creatures as he is absorbed into Dormammu's dimension, and if he loses all identity in joining a Borg-like army of mindless ones, there's no telling what type of terror Terror, Dormammu's army will unleash upon the world in the Doctor Strange sequels. It's the end and the beginning. If Caecilius is in fact a mindless one, would we ever be able to tell it was Mads Mikkelsen underneath that dense outer shell and behind that glowing red eye? We'll see. I see they made you master of this sanctum. Brother Voodoo. In one of the more subdued cameos, a character from the Doctor Strange comics made a brief appearance, but only under his alter ego. He wasn't flat out named in the movie, but according to director Scott Derrickson, an actor named Mark Anthony Brighton was playing a larger role than just that of one of the Ancient One's guardians. In the film, Derrickson assigned this character the name of Daniel Drum. True fans might recognize Drum as the alter ego of Brother Voodoo, a deep cut character from the comics. Derrickson revealed the guy's identity during a Q&A following the release of the film. He stated that Daniel Drum was killed by Caecilius, setting the stage for the character to be resurrected as Brother Voodoo in a later installment, just as he appears in the comics. Derrickson explained that when you go to make a movie like this, you have this huge buffet of characters. I don't see a Doctor Strange franchise without him. Spirit bound to his twin brother Jericho, Brother Voodoo is a Haitian superhero who eventually becomes the new Sorcerer Supreme. It'll be interesting to see if the MCU follows this arc as they delve deeper into the Doctor Strange mythos. Vaulting boots of Valtor. Valtor. Valtor is the name that gets thrown around a lot by Strange and his associates. Valtor is first mentioned under the title of The Vapors of Valtor in Doctor Strange's first appearance, Strange Tales number 115. There have never been any footwear in the comics, like the vaulting boots of Valtor that are mentioned in the movie, but Valtor's name is lent to many magic artifacts throughout the comics. Other mystical objects also have their origins in classic issues, like the Wand of Watum, which first showed up in the Amazing Spider-Man Annual number two. Too, famous for the first adventure to feature Doctor Strange and the Web Slinger in the same comic book. As Steve Ditko created both characters, it's awesome to see him play with the styles of both superheroes in the same panels. The Cloak of Levitation has also been around since Strange Tales number 127 in Dormammu's second appearance, but even the experts at the website Den of Geek don't believe the cloak has ever been given as much of a mind of its own as it has in the movie. Most importantly, Doctor Strange's magic eye of Agamotto is used by the Doctor to manipulate the time around him. Fans strongly believe this to be the Time Stone, one of the Infinity Stones for which Thanos is searching. 
Uh, what's this, my mantra? Shambhala. Shambhala is a great classic rock song by Three Dog Night and a great joke in the Doctor Strange movie. In the midst of Stephen Strange's training, Mordo hands him a browned scrap of paper with the mysterious text Shambhala scratched onto it. Strange and we, the audience, assume it's some kind of awe-inspiring magical word, but Mordo clarifies it's the Wi-Fi password. <sighs> However, in the Hindu and Tibetan Buddhist religions, Shambhala is a sacred kingdom that's home to legendary texts and is a site of great knowledge. It's also the title of a 1986 strange story in which the Sorcerer Supreme deals with the passing of the Ancient One. Sure, Shambhala is just a bit played for laughs in the movie, but if the characters know about it enough to name a Wi-Fi password after it, maybe it does serve some importance to the story going forward. And perhaps the movie is making a connection between the ancient source of knowledge and our new unlimited source of knowledge, the internet. Maybe Doctor Strange just needs to ask himself the same question Three Dog Knight asks in their song. How does your light shine in the halls of Shambhala? A what? You might have a gift for the mystic gods, but you still have much to learn. It goes without saying now that Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, and indeed comic book movies in general, are packed to the rafters with Easter eggs, references, and details that aren't particularly easy to spot. Well, you're not wrong. 2017's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was no different. In fact, given that Nerd King James Gunn was directing, it's probably fair to say that it contained more fun inclusions than most movies. In this video, we'll look at 10 of them that you probably missed. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. It's the best way of keeping up to date with all of Screen Rant's great new videos. Showtime, a-holes. Mattel Football. Remember that scene right at the beginning of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, when the titular team were tasked by the Sovereign to fight the Abelisk, the multidimensional being that was devouring the power sources on their home planet? Well, you may also remember that Peter Quill was holding a gadget in his hand prior to the creature's arrival. It was clearly some kind of sensor, as its screen depicted the five members of the Guardians of the Galaxy in green, while also showing the incoming Abelisk in red. But did you notice? what the gadget actually was? It was a modified Mattel football game from Earth, and another important nod to Quill's past. Mattel football was a handheld game that was first released in 1977, which was just before Peter Quill was born, but it certainly makes sense that they'd still be around when he was growing up. It was incredibly popular, and it could be argued that it was the first major standalone handheld video game smash hit. <sighs> That's intense. Interestingly, it has also been featured in a number of other movies before its appearance in the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, such as 1996 crime comedy Bottle Rocket and 2001's satirical comedy Wet Hot American Summer. Prepare for a really bad landing! Berhurt. Early in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, when the titular team were attempting to escape from the Sovereign's hostile fleet, and while Rocket and Peter Quill argued about which of them is the better pilot, Gamora pointed out that they could find safety if they headed to a nearby planet. That nearby planet was Burhurt, which Gamora actually named during a loud combat sequence, and the name also appeared on the screen briefly alongside a string of coordinates specifying its location in the universe after the Guardians crash-landed there. For most Marvel Cinematic Universe fans, and indeed most casual comic book fans, the name Burhurt means nothing, but it's actually quite important in the comics. It's the home of the Sagittarians, and it first appeared way back in 1969 in The Incredible Hulk number 111. Its people, the aforementioned Sagittarians, are a race who were thrust into a conflict involving the Hulk, a character called the Galaxy Master, and their own leader, Princess Daedra. Could Burhurt's inclusion in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 be hinting at that story coming to the MCU at some point? It's certainly not out of the question, but it's a cool Easter egg regardless. You know what they say, you're out of luck until you've gone duck. Contraxia. While the Guardians of the Galaxy were on Bearheart, doing their best to avoid the wrath of the Sovereign and getting better acquainted with Peter Quill's father, Ego, there was a different kind of action going on on another planet. The planet in question was Contraxia, where Yondu and the Ravagers were shown to be enjoying some debauchery befitting of their characters, in the form of alcohol and brothels populated by robotic ladies of the night. Like Bearheart, Contraxia may have seemed like an irrelevant planet with a silly name, but it also has more significance than me 
it's the eye. In the comics, it's the homeworld of Marie, the mother of the powerful hero known as Jack of Hearts. The planet needed a solution to their dying son, so when an Earth scientist came up with a possible free energy that he called Zero Fluid, Marie went to Earth in human form and married him. Marie was ultimately killed in a tragic accident, leaving her son, Jack Hart, to be doused in his father's chemicals, resulting in him gaining energy manipulation powers. Is he cool? Hell yeah, he's cool. Now that we know Contraxia exists in the MCU, we may see Jack of Hearts in the future of the franchise. No, what? Cronins. There was a very funny and memorable scene in Volume 2 in which Rocket, Yandu, and Groot made 700 space jumps to reach Ego's planet in order to help Peter Quill. You remember it, right? It was the scene where their faces distorted in a hilariously cartoonish way because they weren't really supposed to make that many jumps. Their journey took them to a variety of different locations across the cosmos, including one where Stan Lee's character was hanging out with a group of Watchers, probably boring them to death with stories about his time on Earth. Hey, wait, where are you going? But one of the locations they jumped through briefly showed a species that Marvel Cinematic Universe fans know quite well. It only lasted a couple of seconds, but two Cronins could be seen fighting on an unidentified planet. They're the same species as Korg from 2017's Thor Ragnarok, and that huge roaring warrior that Thor turned to rubble in 2013's Thor The Dark World. Who knows, one of them might even have been Korg prior to his enslavement on Sakaar. It was a really smart little easter egg that further emphasizes the fact that all Marvel Cinematic Universe movies take place in the same reality. I have found meaning. Eternity. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was undoubtedly the most cosmic of the MCU's movies to date, so it was no surprise to uncover the true meaning of this particular moment in the movie. When Ego was revealing his plan to take over the universe to his son, Peter Quill, he tapped him on the forehead and gave him some kind of cosmic vision. As a result, Peter's eyes turned black and starry, and he said he could see eternity. To most people, Peter was simply referring to the fact that he could see everything in existence, or the fact that he could see beyond the edge of the known universe, but the most clued up of Marvel fans knew he was referring to the cosmic being known as Eternity. Really? In the comic books, Eternity's whole body just so happens to be black and starry, just like Peter's eyes during his vision. The gigantic and immensely powerful character had previously been pictured in the first Guardians movie as well, on the walls of the Temple Vault on Mirag, right at the start of the movie. Eternity played a major role in the Infinity Gauntlet comic book arc, and if these MCU Easter eggs were foreshadowing the introduction of the character on the big screen, things are gonna get awesome real quick. Hey, come on. Peter's grandfather. So, do you remember what Ego's big plan was in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? He planted his celestial seeds all over the universe with the intention of combining his power with another celestial being, in this case his son, Peter Quill, in order to have those seeds grow all over the cosmos and shape the universe in his own image. Well, when Kurt Russell's character put his plan into action and started to take over the planets where he'd left those seeds, a gigantic blue cosmic blob started growing near a Dairy Queen in Missouri and began to envelop the planet Earth. That's disgusting. At one point in that scene, the blob only barely missed crushing a car. It was very easy to miss the fact that the passenger in that car was none other than Peter Quill's grandfather, played by Greg Henry, who was making his second appearance in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, having first appeared as a younger version of the same character in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And the fact that we know he's still alive opens the door for a reunion between Grandpa Quill Will and his long lost grandson in the future of the franchise. Who? Simon Williams. Suffice to say, you definitely missed this one because it wasn't actually in the movie, but it's definitely still worth including here. When Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was still in production, some interesting details were spotted on a small town set. It was in a scene on Earth at an event called the Simon Williams Film Festival. There were a number of fake movie posters that featured frequent James Gunn collaborator Nathan Fillion as the actor Simon Williams. There was a movie starring Williams as Tony Stark in a movie about Stark's life, a movie called 
called Archon, which looked like a Conan the Barbarian type adventure, a generic romantic comedy called Oh Rebecca, an action thriller called Dead Before Arrival that looked similar to The Born Identity, a horror called Haxan 2, which looked very similar to Horns, and the awesome sounding Toxic Janitor 2, which was a takeoff on the Toxic Avenger, a movie by the brilliant Trauma Company where Gunn got his start in the world of making movies. Awesome! The reason this is important, even though the scene never made it into the movie, is because Simon Williams, the guy Nathan Fillion was playing in those posters, just so happens to be the superhero Wonder Man in Marvel's comics. So we now know that he exists in the MCU. And look, sir. The Troll Doll. In the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, Peter Quill quite literally trolled Yondu when he replaced the orb with a troll doll, when Yondu thought he was going to be getting his hands on an Infinity Stone. When the leader of the Ravagers died in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Peter placed that very same troll doll by his side. It was easily distinguishable as the same one because of its checkered jacket, and that brief, easily missable moment was more important than people might have realized. It meant that Yondu had kept it because it had sentimental value in spite of the fact he was expecting to possess an Infinity Stone in its place. Instead of feeling angry and betrayed at Peter swapping the items and double-crossing him, Yandu was actually proud, because he brought him up to be a smart Ravager. Yeah, Quill turned out okay. Yandu specified in the movie that he felt as though he was Peter's real daddy, and the fact that he'd kept an item that reminded him of his adopted son proved that he cared for him and he wanted to be reminded that he'd done a good job of raising him. Of course, Yandu also quite clearly enjoyed collecting silly little trinkets, so there's that too. It's a Ravager funeral. Eldritch Magic in one of the many mid-credits scenes of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Sylvester Stallone's Staker O'Gord reunited with his former teammates. They were Aletta O'Gord, played by Michelle Yeoh, Martin X, played by Michael Rosenbaum, Charlie 27, played by Ving Rhames, Mainframe, played by Miley Cyrus, and Krugar, who must have been completely CGI because he apparently wasn't played by anybody. It's the worm-like Krugar that we're going to be talking about here, as he did something pretty important when Staker O'Gord's team got back together. When O'Gord suggested that the team should go back to their old ways. Every team member agreed in their own unique style. Krugar's method of agreeing with his leader was to conjure a mandala in the shape of a thumbs up, a mandala being a fiery holographic shape created using eldritch magic. What people might not realize is that eldritch magic is the same exact thing Doctor Strange and the Masters of the Mystic Arts have used previously in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In the comics, Krugar was actually Strange's apprentice, and he went on to succeed his master as Sorcerer Supreme. His use of Eldritch Magic could be hinting at something similar happening in the MCU's future. <laughs> the Credits as with all Marvel Cinematic Universe movies these days, it's well worth watching Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2's credits, and not just for the mid- and post-credits scenes. The credits themselves were full of fun Easter eggs for viewers to spot, and some pretty cool songs from the soundtrack played over them to boot. Pretty much every major character in the movie, from Nebula to Peter Quill's grandfather, was seen dancing along to the music, while Howard the Duck also made an appearance. But a couple of characters who weren't in the movie appeared too. Cosmo the Space Dog, who was briefly seen in the first Guardians movie, was one of them, and Jeff Goldblum's Grand Master from Thor Ragnarok joined in with the dancing. David Hasselhoff, who briefly appeared in the movie itself and sang on the soundtrack, also appeared, saying, We are Groot. Speaking of which, amongst the text on the screen, the words I am Groot could be seen on a number of occasions before transforming into credits. And finally, just like in the credits from the first Guardians movie, the words no raccoons or tree creatures were harmed during the making of this feature were included, but this time they were followed by the words, the same cannot be said for the handlers of said raccoons and tree creatures. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it be facing off against hulking green monsters, giant wolves, and attractive yet deadly goddesses, Thor Ragnarok has more than enough action to keep one on the edge of their seat. There are several Easter eggs and nods to certain characters and storylines that may seem surprising. In the midst of all the commotion, it is understandable if you didn't pick up on some of them. So sit back and relax as we count down on important details that you might have missed. Don't let me down. Want to get notified when new and enticing Screen Rant content is uploaded? Hit that subscribe button to keep up with the most recent film theories and news. So, King of Asgard. Thor becomes king. 
Ever since Thor The Dark World was released in 2013, Thor Odinson was on a quest to find his long-lost father, Odin. After finding out that Loki was pretending to be their father for several years, he demanded his help to seek him out. I know exactly where he is. They eventually found him on Earth with the help of Doctor Strange's magic and wisdom. Curiously enough, Odin within the comics has been sent to Earth before, something longtime comic book fans may have picked up on. Unfortunately, their reunion was short-lived. Hey, 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 take it easy, man. But as Odin passed away and Thor essentially took up the mantle as King of Asgard. However, this is not the first time the eye-patched King Thor has appeared within Marvel Comics. The Thor God of Thunder storyline that was released during 2012 depicted an older yet more powerful Thor in the far future who had been King of Asgard for several thousands of years. This storyline pitted him up against the Devourer of Worlds, Galactus, who was on a mission to feed upon the long-dead planet Earth. To defeat the hungry giant, Thor had to obtain the insane power of the Necro Sword, which also has been referenced within Thor Ragnarok. Who knows? Maybe if the Fox and Marvel deal comes through, we may be able to see old King Thor face off against the mighty Galactus at some point or another. It's main event time. Planet Hulk. Although not very subtle, the inspiration for one of the locations featured within Thor Ragnarok's plot is actually from a widely popular comic book storyline known as Planet Hulk. Due to certain film rights to characters within the Fantastic Four and X-Men franchises, it would be quite complicated to have Planet Hulk on the big screen. <laughs> Sakaar is the planet that Thor found himself on after Hela got the best of him in their battle. However, after the events of Avengers Age of Ultron, Hulk's Quinjet also crash-landed on Sakaar. This led the Hulk to become the Green Scar and a celebrated gladiator within the Grand Master's Colosseum. However, one big difference is that Green Scar within the comic book story sought freedom and wanted no part of being a gladiator, while Hulk within the film actually enjoyed beating the pulp out of other gladiators for the amusement of the crowds. One may notice that the armor pieces that Green Scar War within the comic book is also very similar to that of Hulk's in the movie. Heck, even the initial fight in the Planet Hulk animated film has Hulk face off against a worthy friend and rival of Thor, that being Beta Ray Bill, who shockingly enough is also teased within the film. Oh, Thor. Wanna use a big wooden fork? Arena Champions. Remember that we mentioned Beta Ray Bill being teased within the film? Well, he is not the only character who was briefly shown. If you pay attention to the Grand Master's Tower, you will see the four faces of former champions that fought in the arena before Thor and Hulk did. Beta Ray Bill has longtime connections to not only Asgard, but also Thor as their battle led Bill to become the worthy wielder of Stormbreaker, a hammer similar to that of Mjolnir. The other faces belong to that of Ares, the Greek god of war, By Beast, a dangerous two-faced android, and the Man-Thing. These characters are not strangers to the Hulk, because he has fought against Ares and the by beasts several times. Even the Man-Thing has gotten the best of the Hulk before. The question does arise, though. Will we ever get to see these bizarre and mysterious characters on the big screen? Will Beta Ray Bill fight alongside Thor Odin's son in the battle against Thanos, the Mad Titan, in Avengers Infinity War? Will Thor get to wield the Stormbreaker after losing his iconic Mjolnir hammer? Only time will tell as to what characters will actually partake in one of Marvel's biggest films. Yet. Wait, wait, you're not gonna face him, are you? Yes, I am. Gore the God Butcher. Gore the God Butcher is definitely not a well-known Marvel villain, but he is by far one of the most dangerous opponents that Thor had ever faced. Gore earned his title by slaying pantheons of gods across several timelines, which eventually led him to fight against and even defeat Thor. What? As we went over before, Thor's status as king and appearance were inspired by the storyline depicted in Thor God of Thunder. When the eye patch wearing old King Thor had to protect the Earth from the clutches of Galactus, he discovered the power of the Necro Sword. The Necro Sword gives the user the ability to create a wide array of weapons and even armor. Hela is seen crafting swords, blades, and other sorts of weaponry when she fights against the Asgardian army, Thor, and even Surtur at the end of the film. When Gore finds himself fighting against Thors from several timelines, he showcases the same abilities that Hela did as well. Additionally, Thor Ragnarok's producer Brad Winderbaum revealed that Gore was definitely an inspiration for Kate Blanchett's portrayal of Hela in the film. Even though Gore himself wasn't in Thor Ragnarok, at least one aspect of his character was shown through Hela. What are you exactly? The Celestials. 
The Celestials are a mysterious yet ancient race which were teased all the way back in the 2014 film Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. When the Collector spoke about the nature and origin of the Infinity Stones, we could see a celestial being showcased. Additionally, nowhere is a mining facility which is actually the severed head of a Celestial. However, a Celestial was also teased briefly in Thor Ragnarok. When the Grandmaster is witnessing the battle between Thor and Hulk in the Gladiator Arena, one can see the costume of what seems to be a Celestial being. The Celestials within the comic books play important roles in seeking out worthy civilizations to help them advance. Or, in the case of the Collector's flashback, seek out civilizations to destroy using the Infinity Stones. There's a little pee coming out of me right now. Although we have yet to see a living Celestial on screen, with the exception of Ego and Peter Quill in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, it is very likely that they will become involved alongside the abstract entities when they fight against Thanos in Infinity War's second part. Question is, however, will Marvel have the intention to actually show the Celestials in their true power and glory. Loki, my boy. Asgardian play. One of the most hilarious scenes throughout Thor Ragnarok is undoubtedly the play dubbed The Tragedy of Loki. In the events of Thor The Dark World, Loki fools Thor into thinking that he had sacrificed himself to save Thor's life. This death not only fooled Thor, but also the audience. Hurts, doesn't it? Loki is not called the god of mischief for nothing. Piss off, ghost! It is revealed at the end of the film that Loki was actually pretending to be Odin and left his adoptive father on Earth. This play pretend trick by Loki was soon unveiled by Thor, which jumpstarted the plot of the movie to seek out Odin. Within the play, Loki mentions how he turned Thor into a frog when they were younger. Shockingly, this is actually a nod to Throg, a frog with the powers of Thor, which debuted back in 1986. However, the best part about this scene is the actors who play the characters' parts. Loki is played by none other than Matt Damon, while Thor is played by Chris Hemsworth real-life older brother, Luke Hemsworth. Curiously enough, Sam Neill plays the part of Odin, which is coincidental because Sam's Jurassic Park co-star, Jeff Goldblum, is also in the film. Talk about a jam-packed cameo scene. Hey, man. The Warbound. Planet Hulk not only inspired the setting of Sakaar for Thor Ragnarok, but also introduced us to some members of the Warbound. Over here. Rocks waving at you. Yeah. Korg is the clear and uncontested comedic relief within the film who is inseparable from Meek, his sidekick. However, within the Planet Hulk storyline, Korg and Meek play very different roles. Hulk meets them in the Gladiator Arena alongside the rest of the Warbound. They form a sort of familiar bond after they help Hulk defeat the Silver Surfer, who was the Grand Mas <clears throat> the Red King's champion in the comic book storyline. After Hulk and the Warbound obtain their freedom, they find themselves traveling to the Earth to fight the Earth's heroes alongside the Hulk. Although a World War Hulk story on the big screen seems very unlikely for now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe found a good way to introduce more than just one of Planet Hulk's elements. Those who loved the tear-jerking yet hilarious one-liners from the duo are in for a treat, as Thor Ragnarok's Taika Waititi has mentioned that a spin-off feature for those two characters has been talked about. Why, thank you. So, hopefully, this may not be the last we see of those characters. Odin's Treasure Odin's Trophies those who have seen the very first Thor film, which debuted in 2011, may remember a very brief Easter egg that hinted at the Infinity Gauntlet we will see Thanos obliterate the Avengers with this April. However, this is contradictory due to seeing Thanos equip himself with the Infinity Gauntlet in 2015's Avengers Age of Ultron end credits scene. Also, due to all the Infinity Stones being scattered. For instance, the Tesseract is, or well, was, in Asgard. The Collector has the Reality Gem. The Power Gem is on Xandar. Doctor Strange has the Time Gem. And finally, the Mind Gem is literally a part of Vision. Plus, the one in Odin's trophy room was adorned with almost all of them. However, Thor Ragnarok essentially further made it clear that the Infinity Gauntlet that is within Odin's collection is actually fake, as are many other things within it. Seeing Hela knock over the gauntlet is not only humorous, but her comment regarding the collectibles fixes a continuity error within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Talk about a retcon! Fortunately, we will see the genuine and very real Infinity Gauntlet in action on April 27th, when Infinity War releases worldwide. Let's just hope that the other stones Thanos finds are fake, for the Avengers' sake. And you are an old man and a fool! Unworthy Thor 
For those who have kept up with Marvel's recent Thor comics, one may know that Thor became unworthy and the power of Thor, alongside the Mjolnir hammer, were given to Jane Foster instead. Thor had to overcome a trial during 2011's Thor film, after his father Odin believed he was too arrogant and cocky to be worthy of such power. Although Thor was not deemed unworthy since then in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he still lost Mjolnir after Hela utterly destroyed it in front of him. While Thor wasn't as mighty without his hammer in the comics, Odin made Thor realize that Mjolnir was never his source of power, and was merely just a tool to help focus it. This allowed Thor to unleash what he was truly capable of and became far stronger than he ever thought was possible. Regardless, it is easy to see the connection that Thor lost Mjolnir in both iterations and must master his powers without the aid of the hammer. Fortunately, Thor may obtain access to another Asgardian weapon soon. Whether it be the Yarnbjorn, which Thor used in his younger days before he ever wielded Mjolnir, or Beta Ray Bill's Stormbreaker, we'll have to wait and see. We're about to jump on that ginormous spaceship. You wanna come? Thanos Spaceship. With the release of Infinity War Part 1 upon us, it's easy to get focused on how the other Marvel films are supposed to connect. However, we do see in the end credit scene of Thor Ragnarok that the spaceship the Asgardians are on has been discovered by Thanos' humongous ship. Additionally, the Infinity War trailer has revealed to us that at some point in the film, Thor will be drifting in space only to be found by the Guardians of the Galaxy. This possibly means that Thanos will have destroyed Thor's ship and will continue on his quest to reach the Earth. We also know that the Hulk will crash land on Earth and will find fight alongside the Winter Soldier, who you might have seen in the end credit scene of February's Black Panther release. Ever since 2011, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has teased the Infinity Stones and Thanos. The majority of that is mostly due to Asgard and Loki's schemes. It's only natural that Thor Ragnarok teased what will more than likely be the opening sequence in Infinity War. If you missed Thanos' ship at the end sequence, don't worry, it'll be very hard to miss it on April 27th. Well, you're not wrong. By now, you all know everything there is to know about Ryan Coogler's Marvel epic, Black Panther. Or do you? The superhero movie that pays a long overdue tribute to African American culture has more than we see at first glance. To add to the awesomeness of this film, we've got all the hidden Easter eggs, secrets, and references you missed. From the shout out to The Lion King, to insulting Alexander McQueen's shoes, and way more. Think you got them all? Well, watch until the end to find out. Subscribe to Screen Rant if you aren't already part of our crew and be the first to know about everything to do with film. As the tradition goes, there is always a Marvel Legend appearance. In Black Panther, it was co-creator Stan Lee. You can catch him in the Korean casino scene as he claims to Chala's poker chips for himself. Also on IMDb, his character name is Thirsty Gambler, because why not? A reference to the 1998 Black Panther miniseries by Peter B. Gillis and Dennis Cohen is placed at the climax at the film. It is the rhino battle scene when T'Challa and Killmonger's armies go head to head. In the sequence where T'Challa takes down one of the rhinos, the film almost matches the comic book frame for frame. Did you pick that up in the film? There's a little hint that Doctor Strange may be a supervillain on Killmonger's side. Why? Killmonger mentions that his allies are in New York, Hong Kong, and London, the exact cities that Doctor Strange has his temples. Suspicious. The line, oh great, another broken white boy for me to fix, isn't just out of the blue. Shuri says it to Everett Ross, who T'Challa has just saved and brought back. This is a nod to Captain America Civil War, when Steve Rogers dropped Bucky in Wakanda, so Shuri is referencing having to previously take care of Bucky Barnes. When Andy Serkis' character is held in custody, he repeatedly says a line from the song, What is Love by Hathaway. Shout out to A Night at the Roxbury. Shuri makes a comment about T'Challa's sandals making a hilarious joke by saying, What are those? Which is actually a reference to a viral vine that went on to create the famous What are those? memes. Man Ape was an actual character back when the Black Panther comics were released in 1969, but Ryan Coogler knew that name wasn't going to fly today for obvious reasons. However, instead of scrapping the character altogether, they used his actual name, M'Baku. A hidden egg, but we found it. James Bond had a huge influence in the film, which director Ryan Coogler admitted. Sure he be likened to Q, while Everett is the classy CIA operative. Also, the casino is a beautiful callback to the casino in Skyfall. Can you notice any other James Bond references throughout the film? Let us know in the comments below. Oakland is the city where Black Panther opens. Coogler had it begin in 1992 so he could give a shout out to the hip hop group that embraced the culture of the Black Panther movement. Also, Oakland was where the Black Panther political party was formed in 1966. 
party was also formed some months before the comics were released. The Lion King got its overdue need of praise through Black Panther. Visual aesthetics and specific shots were direct references to Disney's animated masterpiece. The final battle sequence of the film took place in an actual underground railway. No set there. Also, a secret that was mainly brushed past. Ryan Coogler is a huge fan of Academy Award winning Barry Jenkins from the film Moonlight. Jenkins' next film is starring Chadwick Boseman, and Ryan gave feedback to Jenkins on his work. As an homage to his love of the film, Coogler put the young actor Alex Hibbert in the closing scene of Black Panther. Shuri shows T'Challa alternate necklaces, one of which is a reference to his costume design of the late 1990s comic book. Later on, Killmonger wears that necklace for his costume. Black Panther is one of the Marvel characters where their powers can be passed down. A major tribute to the original comics of 1970 was made by naming Shuri's lab Mount Bashanga, the location where Vibranium is mined. Bashanga was the name of the first Black Panther from thousands of years ago, according to the comics. So there are two post credit scenes, as you know, but in the second one, they left us a little Easter egg. It features the character Bucky Barnes, a character who's been absent for a long time. Bucky was previously frozen in ice, but back in Wakanda, Shuri has deprogrammed him and he is in rehabilitation. Following the hugely hinted return of Bucky Barnes is the major hint of what the kids call him the White Wolf. In the comics, the White Wolf is a boy who was made an orphan after a plane crashed and was later adopted by T'Chaka. Could this be MCU foreshadowing? During the interrogation scene of Ulysses Claw, you can see a blurry television scene in the background, featuring what appears to be a bearded Captain America. You gotta look close, but it's there. Ryan Coogler's cinematographer also shot his critically acclaimed film, Fruitvale Station. She is also the first female director of photography to receive an Oscar nom, which was for Mudbound. Of course, no film is truly complete without a Star Wars nod. Shuri wears her hair in two buns on the side of her head, referencing Princess Leia in A New Hope. Killmonger nabs a mask when Claw and himself break into the British Museum. He continues to wear the mask, which is a reference to an earlier battle with Black Panther from the comics. Find the 2008 Volume 4 comic and you can see the mask close and personal. Black Panther's suit is designed with mystic runes on it, which in the comics has a deeper meaning. Black Panther doesn't want to be reliant on vibranium, so he begins to incorporate magic, just like in the comics. John Connie plays T'Chaka's younger self, and he is actually a Tandwa Connie's T'Chaka in real life, which is why the two look so similar. So no, it wasn't CGI magic at play this time. Back to the Future 2 got a major shout out in Black Panther. It is when T'Challa replaces his sandals for a more practical shoe wear choice, sneakers that do up around his ankles, which is a different reference to the Nike runners that Marty wears. How do we know this for sure? Well, it is confirmed when Shuri says the design was inspired by an old American movie. There is a major shout out to rapper Whale, who makes a cameo in the film. You can spot him if you have a quick eye at the beginning of the film when T'Challa walks through the streets of Wakanda. In Captain America Civil War, T'Challa cradled his father T'Chaka in his arms. In Black Panther, Killmonger cradles his father Njobu, played by Sterling K. Brown in the exact same way. The vibranium nanomachine that make up T'Challa's suit is an explanation to Tony Stark's Iron Man armor that drew attention in the Avengers Infinity War trailer. Previous to being called Black Panther, the creators named it Black Leopard to avoid any confusion with the Black Panther group during the civil movement. However, noting that it was a good relation, they kept the title Black Panther. One remaining hint from the former title is Killmonger's suit. When he takes over Black Panther, instead of appearing like a panther, the designer favors more of a leopard. Once again, about T'Challa's shoes. When Shuri makes fun of him, we're certain she didn't know they were actually Alexander McQueen design. <laughs> oh well. Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, threw himself on a grenade in the first Avengers. As a shout out to the selfless hero, T'Challa does the same in Black Panther. When Killmonger throws T'Challa off the cliff, it is a direct reference to the comic books. Also, the fight between M'Baku and T'Challa takes place at dawn, a symbol for a new birth. But T'Challa's fight with Killmonger takes place at sunset, a symbol of his downfall. Coogler, the young genius director who we can't wait to see more from after this beautifully made film. One last bonus egg. When Okoye, T'Challa, and Nakia are in South Korea, their outfits together match up to make the color of the Pan-African flag. Red, black, and green. Now that you've seen Avengers Infinity War, it's time to take a step back from the bigger picture and enjoy some of the smaller moments from the film. Between all of the great action and character interactions are a collection of Marvel Easter eggs that you may have missed. Before you watch, click subscribe. You'll join our notification squad and be the first to know of new Screen Rant content.
All right, Guardians, don't forget, this might be dangerous, so let's put on our mean faces. Loki's time in Avengers Infinity War may have been short-lived, but just before his shocking death, Thor's brother did get to deliver a nice callback to the original Avengers. In the first Avengers, Tony Stark delivers the We Have a Hulk one-liner to Loki before the Hulk emerges and causes all types of destruction. In Infinity War, Loki delivers the same line to Thanos, but Hulk's efforts are not enough to save Loki from dying. After Loki's death, tears only came from one of Thor's eyes due to his brutal injury from Thor Ragnarok. Thankfully, the pirate angel didn't have limited vision for too long. After building up a gag for multiple movies, Rocket Raccoon or Rabbit as Thor referred to him gave Thor one of the eyes he has collected over the years. Rocket's penchant for collecting body parts has finally paid off, but Bucky Barnes better watch out or he could be the next target. While Rocket Raccoon was dealing with loose eyeballs, the teenage Groot was doing what most teenage boys do wasting his time with video games. What were you thinking? Throughout the film, Groot was using a retro handheld game. Look close and the game name is Defender. The plot of the game follows a ship which must shoot away at an endless array of aliens. Sounds a lot like the Guardians of the Galaxy, and probably the exact reason the specific handheld game was chosen for Groot to play. Just like his role in Captain America Civil War, Spider-Man steals nearly every scene he is in, and for the Infinity War, he gets a whole new suit and superpower. The superpower is his spider sense. First seen on the bus with the hairs on his arms raising, the spidey sense is used in a tragic way towards the end of the movie. As characters die off and fade to ashes, Spider-Man can sense his impending death coming unlike a majority of the other characters. This is why his death scene was extended for so long. Speaking of the Spider-Man bus scene, the moment marks one of Marvel's great traditions, the Stan Lee cameo. This time around, Lee plays the bus driver, who thinks nothing of seeing an alien ship fly across the sky. Besides Stan Lee, another great Marvel tradition is the post credits scene. For Infinity War, we get one scene, but three Easter egg surprises. The first is the return of Nick Fury after being absent from several Marvel films. Fury's appearance will help promote his upcoming role in Captain Marvel. The person with Fury was Maria Hill, an agent who was featured in both previous Avengers movies. Both characters disappear and become victim to Thanos' deadly Infinity Gauntlet finger snap. Right before Nick Fury disappears, he sends out a distress signal. The signal appears to have the Captain Marvel logo on it, indicating we will see Captain Marvel not only in her own solo film, but in the fourth Avengers in 2019. Thanos showed no mercy while attacking various members of the Avengers. In many cases, he harnessed the power of the Infinity Gauntlet to unleash his attack. For Captain America, taking out the hero only took one massive punch. In the Infinity War miniseries comic book, Thanos also used a single punch on Captain America, but the giant fist killed him in the panels. Thankfully in the movie, Captain America was able to recover within a few minutes, just a few minutes too late to save his friends. While Captain America was dealt a devastating punch, Thanos had fun playing around with other heroes, mainly the Guardians of the Galaxy. In their fight scene, he turns Mantis into a spool of ribbon while transforming Drax into a collection of large cubes. Both of those moments were taken directly from the comics, even though his victims were Nebula and Star Fox in Marvel panels. Another scene taken straight from the Infinity War comic book panels came from Spider-Man's attempted attack on Thanos. In the movie, he shoots Thanos right in the face with some webbing. The moment worked great in the movie, even if it wasn't really effective for Spider-Man. At least he didn't suffer the same fate as the comics by seeing his skull crust on a large rock. Hmm. Tony Stark's visions of the future have changed his outlook on being a hero. We've seen this transition through the films, and in a speech during Age of Ultron, Stark looks up into deep space and says, that's the endgame right there. Doctor Strange brings the same speech back by stating, we're in the endgame now. This was a clear reference to Stark's speech and premonitions of the future. Doctor Strange played a pretty big role in Infinity War, and had the chance to show off some of his magic in a one-on-one -on -one battle with Thanos. To fight the Purple Beast, Doctor Strange used magic known as the Images of Ikon. Also used in the comics, Doctor Strange clones his body and has multiple versions appear. Seeing the comic book art come alive on the screen made Doctor Strange seem even more powerful. One of the biggest shockers in Infinity War was the return of the Captain America villain Red Skull. In a huge twist, Red Skull has been the keeper of the Soul Stone all this time and held it on the planet Vormir. While the Red Skull makeup was still top notch, the look and voice may have felt slightly off because it was a whole different performer behind the mask. Hugo Weaving did not return for the role and was recast by Ross Marquand, a former cast member of The Walking Dead. 
While Red Skull was stealing the scenes on Vormir, all people were looking for was blue skin on the planet Nowhere. Infinity War directors Anthony and Joe Russo are known for their time on Arrested Development and love to put in nods to the cult comedy. In the collector's home, look in the glass enclosures and spot a man with glasses, painted blue skin, and a pair of jean shorts. He's modeled to look just like Tobias when he auditioned for the Blue Man Group on the TV show. Star-Lord gets to interact with some of his fellow Earthling friends, but clearly times have changed over the years. He mentions the movie Footloose a number of times, including in an exchange with Spider-Man while calling it the greatest movie of all time. Peter Parker quickly snaps back, it never was, and officially started a Footloose and Dirty Dancing debate among the Marvel fanboys. Peter Parker kept the classic movie references coming, referencing the ending in both Alien and Aliens. Peter Parker's plan works to send an alien out to space by blasting a hole out the side of a ship. The homage was a great reference to the classic Alien films. The Guardians of the Galaxy weren't the only ones bringing the comedy this time around, as Tony Stark kept his signature wit about him as chaos and tragedy ensued. At one point, he refers to Ebony Maw as Squidward, one of the main characters of SpongeBob SquarePants. Seeing how SpongeBob is not a global phenomenon, Stark's joke was dubbed over differently in certain countries. For example, in France, he refers to Ebony Maw as Voldemort instead. Both work pretty well for the alien creature. Stark keeps at it with his hero buddies as well. At one point, he jokingly insults Star-Lord by calling him Flash Gordon. The retro sci-fi reference is actually not too far off, as Flash Gordon is about a space traveler who has left Earth and takes on various aliens with a group of heroic friends. We're just not sure who has the coolest costume at this point. If you thought Flash Gordon was an outdated reference, then you should check out Star-Lord's new music player, which made a quick appearance in the movie. Peter Quill has upgraded from the cassette Walkman to an MP3 player which can store hundreds of songs on it. While the Zune sounds like a made-up Space Age MP3 player, it's actually a real product, once sold by Microsoft to compete with the iPod. You could probably find some cheap Zune players on eBay right now. A large part of the Avengers Infinity War takes place in Wakanda. The homeland of the Black Panther is filled with numerous Easter eggs and references. For the locals there, Bucky Barnes is referred to as the White Wolf. In the Black Panther comics, the White Wolf is actually the adopted brother of T'Challa and eventually becomes an enemy to the hero. After Bucky's evil turn in Winter Soldier, he will likely stay good, but could adapt into the White Wolf nickname to fight crime. Captain America doesn't appear in Infinity War as much as he should, but when the hero is on screen, pay close attention to him and his outfit. Once pieces start chipping away, you can see a scale design underneath. This design is reminiscent of several Captain America outfits that were featured in Marvel Comics but never made their way to the big screen. After three solo movies and three Avengers movies, we have finally learned Thor's age during a quick piece of dialogue. The God of Thunder clocks in at 1500 years old. Wonder how many of those years it took him to grow out the long hair before he chopped it all off for the third Thor film. In the comics, Vision has gone through multiple looks over the years, including an all-white appearance for the West Coast Avengers. If you wiped your tears away long enough to notice, as Vision was dying, his body turned all-white for just a few moments, showcasing an alternate look that can be used in the future. Speaking of the future, a small scene focuses on the mention of Thanos' father, Alars. Red Skull mentions him to both Thanos and Gamora. This is crucial in establishing the character, because Alars is a member of the Eternals, a long-rumored Marvel project that has been in the works. Getting his name out there is the perfect way to build hype for the future of the MCU. This <laughs> does put a smile on my face. Ant-Man and the Wasp really wowed the wings off us. This film is packed full of secrets, easter eggs, winks, and throwbacks for old and new fans alike. Computer load up, Celery Man, please. Be aware, there are spoilers ahead. Before we begin, give us a like and subscribe to Screen Rant to join our exclusive club and be the first in the know on all new content. The bartenders are all like, yeah, crazy stupid fine. Let's begin with an easy one. Everyone catch Stan Lee's cameo? He's the elderly man about to get in his car when a shrinking 
disc from the Wasp shrinks the car from sight, revealing Stan Lee. Then he says the humorous line, The 60s were great, but now I'm paying for it. Another cameo for the book of Stan Lee cameos. In the first installment of the Ant-Man films, Scott's trusty friend Luis says this line of dialogue. We got everything nowadays. We got a guy who jumps, we got a guy who swings, we got a guy who crawls up the walls, you gotta be more specific. At the time, fans just thought it was a joke about Spidey. But then, when Spider-Man actually did appear in the MCU, you're the Avengers, man. It made fans pay more attention to what Luis does and says. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, Luis named his company X-Con, not X-Con, which would make more sense. Which leaves us thinking that maybe the X-Men will be joining the MCU soon as well. Giant Man is an alias that superheroes from the Marvel comics have used in the past. Hank Pym was even the first Giant Man to appear in the comics. When Scott ascends to over 60 feet tall while in the San Francisco Bay, every news report gets him on TV. He's referred to as Giant Man. The the first time he's been identified since Captain America Civil War. Seeing as most of his work is done at an almost unnoticeable size, he is most likely going to remain Giant Man to the public. We're sure that Ant-Man is fine with that. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Lawrence Fishburne is the man who played the iconic role of Morpheus in The Matrix. Now he's playing Dr. Bill Foster in Marvel's Ant-Man and the Wasp, and finding himself in similar situations. Sure, he doesn't have tiny black glasses or an epic glistening outfit, but he is in the role of a teacher of sorts to Ghost. So obviously the filmmakers gave a little nod to Fishburne on the chalkboard behind him in one scene. They filled the entire board with mathematical equations and the word Matrix. Though that is a real math word, we're certain that they were referring to the timeless film. Just in case you didn't realize, the ending of Ant-Man and the Wasp actually takes place at the same time as Infinity War. Ant-Man even showed up on the posters for Infinity War, but was never in the film, which made fans ponder as to what happened. Many thought it had something to do with the Quantum Realm. Now that we know that the events of both movies took place at the same time, we understand. But it also seems like Scott will have a big role to play in Avengers 4. A line of dialogue warning about the time vortexes does not go unnoticed to those who frequently watch the MCU films. Many wondered after Infinity War if we'd see the events play out in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and in the mid-credits scene, we did. It wasn't Ant-Man who got dusted, as many thought. It was actually Hank, Hope, and Janet that suffered the results of Thanos' finger snap. Now Ant-Man is just stuck in the Quantum Realm, and Avengers 4 can't come soon enough. Tim Heidecker was added to the cast as the whaleboat captain Daniel Gobler. For those of you who don't know, Tim Heidecker and Eric Wareheim are the creators of Tom Goes to the Mare, and Tim and Eric awesome show great job. Go ahead, say so Tim's cameo as a whale tour guide who thinks that Ant-Man is a whale until he emerges from the water as Giant Man is as random as cameos get. But both Peyton Reed and Kevin Feige have said they are huge fans of Tim and Eric. Scott's daughter Cassie expresses her want to be her father's partner in his superhero endeavors. She wants to be a superhero herself one day, which may seem like just a cute scene to many, but we know in reality that Cassie Lang grows up to be a marvelous hero herself. Cassie grows up putting herself close to Pym Particles to try and give herself powers. But it isn't until Scott passes that Cassie becomes a superhero in the comics, receiving the name Stature, and later Stinger. So this nice little piece of foreshadowing makes us wonder if we'll see a full-grown Cassie Lang in Avengers 4. Despite Randall Park cracking down the law on Scott, he's a lovable and funny character. But his role of Jimmy Woo is more meaningful than many realize. First appearing in the comics in 1956, an adult Jimmy Woo was imperative in the defeat of the Yellow Claw. Much later, Woo would eventually join S.H.I.E.L.D., and later still, the Agents of Atlas. Since 2013, Wu has been the headmaster of the Pan-Asian School for the Unusually Gifted, which is a special academy located in Mumbai for young Asians with superhuman abilities. Sound familiar? A little like Charles Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, huh? It's a big house. It's funny that I only ever see two of you. Believe it or not, the music in the trailer was an Easter egg itself. Those high-pitched notes in the music that kind of sound like a sting were on purpose. Director Peyton Reed confirmed that it was from the band Adam and the Ants, and the song was titled Ants Invasion. How appropriate. In the actual movie, a song titled Ant Music was used. We're really into this whole bug theme. During the press junket for Ant-Man and the Wasp, both the director Peyton Reed and the producer Kevin Feige hinted at Easter eggs hidden in the Quantum Realm. Many fans have noticed two purple eyes in the Quantum Realm. Some people speculate that it was Thanos, while others think it's Dormammu from Doctor Strange. We will likely not have an answer anytime soon, at least until fans can go frame by frame through the psychedelic Quantum Realm sequences. Hank Pym has never been one concerned 
concerned with size, and if there's any theme in the film, it's that size doesn't matter. As you can observe during the scenes in the lab, he has made everything out of old parts of things made big, such as coils from cars and motorcycles made big for support, and many other pieces of enlarged objects. The production team wanted the audience to wonder whether they were watching big heroes made small or small sets made big. Mission accomplished. Are you familiar with the name Jeffrey Ballard? Ballard was a supervillain once opposed to Goliath, Iron Man, and a few other superheroes in a short time on the scene as the villain Centurion. But when bad guy Sonny Birch calls to tattle on Hank, Hope, and Scott, the FBI agent who picks up the phone is Ballard. It's a nice little shout out to include the FBI agent against the superhero as this comic book villain. Before Scott was kidnapped by Hope and Hank, he passes his time by doing various things around the house. One of them is watching National Lampoon's Animal House. When he's kidnapped, the scene plays in the background with Donald Sutherland talking about the universe. He hypothesizes, our whole solar system could be like one tiny atom in the fingernail of some other giant being. Which pretty much foreshadows all the events of the film that unfold. We've already briefly talked about how Infinity War and Ant-Man and the Wasp overlap time, which explains Scott's whereabouts during the third Avengers film. However, he must be left in the quantum realm for a reason. Him being subatomic has to benefit the Avengers in some way. Will Janet's warning about the time vortex has given him a way to gain extra power? Or maybe turn back time to before the universal slaughter by Thanos? Aha! The time travel theory may have been correct after all. Only time vortex will tell. One fan had a theory about the costumes that stated that the face of an ant was in Paul Rudd's costume, while a face of a wasp was in Evangeline Lilly's. Costume designer Louise Frogley told Refinery29 that no, that was not the case. She said they tried to go Easter egg free, but while she was trying to go Easter egg free, they still made a reference to Egghead, Ghost's father's supervillain nickname. His real name was Dr. Elias Starr, and Ghost's costume was designed with a face being similar for her father's evil nickname, Egghead. Dr. Bill Foster is thrown back in the mix in this film, an old colleague of Hank Pym who now has a sort of vendetta against him. Back in the day, Foster was known as Goliath, and now he's no match to what Scott is doing with the technology. But either way, whatever Bill did back then was enough to get a shout out from Tony Stark in Iron Man 2. When Tony began looking for a cure to make Iron Man more powerful, he cites Project Goliath. Everything from projects Pegasus, Exodus, and Goliath. And now here we are, meeting Goliath at last. Speaking of Goliath, there was a flashback scene where we see Bill Foster in his days as a young experimental scientist. But instead of undergoing digital de aging, which is what they did for Michael Douglas in the first Ant Man, Lawrence Fishburne, who plays Bill, called upon his real life son. Langston Fishburne played the young Foster during the events that turned Ava into Ghost. It may have been a small part, but it's the kind of fun movie fact that audiences love, if they know. Notice it, that is. We are vividly reminded of the famous line from Zoolander when Derek yells, A center for ants! But uh, that has no reference here. Ant-Man and the Wasp go to Cassie's school to retrieve Ant-Man's suit. On the blackboard behind them, the teacher has sentences written for the students to rework into the plural possessive form. But between Hope and Scott, you can see one sentence referring to flowers that reads, That my ants grow. Could this be a reference to Scott being stuck in child size that whole scene? The set designers must have been having fun that day. Any Hot Wheels collector of the 1950s versions would know that Hank Pym's car storage case looks mighty fine. The storage case is in the shape of a wheel. And holds all the Hot Wheels cars inside, allowing Hank to essentially carry around his entire garage of fancy cars with him. But that storage case looks like it's in mint condition along with the cars inside, which means Hank has been saving this thing since the 1960s. The car Louise chooses in the end, the uh, purple one with flames, would have been our top choice as well. Once the heroes are put through the ringer and tested on every conceivable level in the film, Hope, Scott, and Cassie take a night off to go to the drive-in movie theater. It's the film that they're watching which is the easter egg. They watch a black and white horror film with giant ants terrorizing civilians. It looks like they're watching the 1954 film Them. It was one of the first films to feature giant bugs. Where the beast spawns its terrible progeny. Ghost's backstory that was given in the second installment of the film has seemed to create plot holes. It was said that she was trained to be used as a secret operative for S.H.I.E.L.D. when her parents passed away. However, the issue with this is that over the course of five seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., no one has even heard of her. Not even in the 19 MCU films. It seems suspicious. We're certain 
certain that they'll figure out a way to patch up her storyline, but for now, there are way more questions than answers. In the end sequence, when Hope, Cassie, and Scott are watching the movie in their shrunken car, there's a foreshadowing of a future villain. When Scott turns on the windshield wipers, a moth attacks the car. Nothing much is made of it, but the MCU could be hinting at the villain Skyne. Originally, she was Sybil Dvorak, but once she joined Night Shift and the Masters of Evil, she was a full-blown villain. Maybe we'll get to see her in Avengers 4. Baba Yaga was used to describe Ghost by Kurt. She's a boogeyman that Marvel fans will know as the goddess of Earth, witchcraft, and misfortune. For hundreds of years, she would eat innocent souls to sustain herself in the forest that she worked on witchcraft. Until one day, she picked a battle with Captain Britain, and even though things looked in her favor, they ended in her demise. We wonder if the comparison between the two will pay off in one of the MCU films. During the post credit scene, we see the giant ant still wearing Scott's ankle bracelet while playing the drums. There's text that reads, Ant-Man and the Wasp will return, followed by a question mark. This is a direct reference to when Dave Filoni wore a t-shirt during the Star Wars celebration in 2017 that said, Ahsoka lives with a question mark one day, and the next day he wore the same shirt but with an exclamation mark instead of a question mark. Could this mean that Ant-Man and the Wasp do survive? <laughs> what do you think? This is awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the 90s. Marvel's latest cinematic installment, Captain Marvel, took superhero movies ahead by going back in time. But did you catch all the secrets and Easter eggs hidden throughout Carol Danvers' debut film? Join Screen Rant as we journey through time and space to uncover the wildest moments that the MCU snuck into this film. When Carol Danvers' crash lands on Earth in 1995, she takes us back to mid-90s dreamland. And that dreamland is Blockbuster. Most 90s kids will fondly remember spending special nights browsing shells for the latest video release or finding the movie with the most obscure cover. The Captain Marvel crew decided to be authentic by filming this scene in the last actual Blockbuster store in the United States, in Bend, Oregon. They even made the sign authentic, since the Blockbuster video sign in the movie was accomplished thanks to special effects. In keeping true to Carol Danvers' comic book arc, the storyline of the movie also has Carol deal with the effects of amnesia. And in a nice little way of connecting with the X-Men, the big screen memory loss is extremely similar to a Captain Marvel comic book story arc where X-Men's Rogue uses her energy-sucking powers to sap Carol of her memories. While she eventually regains her ability to recall events, and Rogue, after this moment, becomes good, the two super-powered women continue to have a contentious relationship. In the film, we learn that Nick Fury once proposed to call a superpowered team of heroes the Protector Initiative. That is, until he decided to call them the Avengers. Now, the Protectors seems like a logical name for a supergroup, but it also might be a nod by the writers to the superhero known as the Protector, aka Novar. Novar was a Kree who also went by the alter ego of Marvel Boy and eventually joined the Avengers himself. There's more Avengers connections than branches on the legendary Asgardian tree Yggdrasil. Mummies hate cats, and now we know why. You can never trust them, especially in Captain Marvel, where Goose the Cat is revealed to be a flurkin. And no, this alien was not named by the Muppet Swedish chef. A flurkin is a powerful being with tendrils that protrude from their mouths, and gateways to miniature dimensions kept within their mouths. This hidden alien storyline wasn't just invented for the movie either. Carol Danvers' cat was also secretly an alien in disguise in the comics, too. If this is a movie set in the 90s, then of course we should expect it to reference 90s movies. One of the biggest blowouts in 90s cinema was James Cameron's action classic, True Lies. Captain Marvel pays tribute to the film when it's advertised on a cardboard stand in Blockbuster. Arnold's head gets blurred off, but Jamie Lee Curtis's figure remains standing on the cardboard. Plus, an additional Easter egg comes from the fact that the fighter jet from True Lies was reused as the jet that the Hulk falls on in the first Avengers movie. Comic book artist Jamie McKelvey gave Carol Danvers a mohawk during his run with the Captain Marvel books in 2012. The hairstyle added a new level of spunk and attitude to the empowering character, and when Carol wears a mohawk-topped costume in the movie, it's a nice nod to McKelvey's take on the character. It also works within the story of the movie as Carol's tribute to Top of the Kree Warriors uniform. In the movie, Lieutenant Trouble is just a nickname that Carol calls Monica. The Lieutenant Trouble moniker is actually a name that comes from the comics, but it's used for a different character. The Captain Marvel comics focusing on Carol Danvers as the titular hero have her interacting with a character named Kit Renner, a young girl who views Carol as a hero. The books feature Kit Renner following Captain Marvel around and wearing a shirt that's made to resemble Carol's costume. 
Carol Danvers' call sign, Avenger, inspired Nick Fury to name his future group the Avengers, as opposed to the Protector Initiative. Yeah, we prefer the Avengers, too. But might he have named the superhero group something different if the Marvel creative team decided to use Carol's call sign from the comics? In the books, Carol's call sign was Cheeseburger, because she vomited one up while flying in a jet. It's not as catchy, but once the MCU runs out of Avengers storylines, maybe the Cheeseburger Initiative is the next supergroup the MCU needs. Project Pegasus is the name of the group Nick Fury created to explore Tesseract-inspired technology. It hadn't seen any airtime references in the MCU since the first Avengers movie, but the Captain Marvel film brought it back in a big way. Marvell worked with Project Pegasus to find a way to make a safe world for the Skrulls, looking to escape prosecution by the Kree. It's an interesting twist that certainly will lead to more details being divulged by Nick Fury. Ronan the Accuser was a zealot and a humorless and driven villain. He was the perfect foil for the aimless Guardians of the Galaxy who messed around just as much as they tried to save the forces of good from the forces of evil. But Ronan isn't the only Accuser around. yon Rog goes on to say that the Accusers intend to bomb the heck out of the good guys' whereabouts. This moment confirmed for us, the audience, that the Accusers is a term used to refer to the members of Ronan's order, as well as the warships that do the bombing. Finally, Captain Marvel gives us Samuel L. Jackson's big comeback to the MCU. Sure, he'd shown up in cameos in the past few films and had a post-credits appearance at the end of Infinity War, but it was to spend some quality time with Fury. And in this film, he alludes to his younger days as a super spy. In the comics, Fury first appeared as Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. Then he showed up in his own series, Nick Fury, Secret Agent, before eventually becoming the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. Another Nick Fury backstory moment comes when Nick reveals he has no children. This could be a lie, though. Nick Fury in the comics has kids, including one who changed his own name to Nick Fury Jr. and took his father's place as a super spy. This allowed Marvel to illustrate a Nick Fury who more closely resembled Sam Jackson. The mid credit scene of Captain Marvel gave us the moment we've been waiting for. Carol finally met the Avengers, or at least what's left of them. After our heroes had managed to reach out to Carol via Nick Fury's pager, Danvers appeared. She looks exactly as she did over 20 years ago, and needs to accept the fact that her old friend Nick dusted into non-existence. But how come she appears to be the same age as before? She's so powerful that time doesn't even have an impact on her? It's cool that Maria's call sign is Photon in the movie, because her daughter, Monica Rambeau, goes by the same name Photon when she becomes a superhero in her own right. Monica is just a child in the film, but in the comics, Monica Rambeau ended up becoming Captain Marvel before Carol Danvers took up the mantle. Monica then went on to become a hero named Spectrum as well. While it remains to be seen what they do with their character, expect great things from Monica in the MCU's future. At the end of the film, Carol Danvers realizes her full potential when she becomes Binary, a nearly all-powerful being who emits seemingly limitless amounts of energy. Captain Marvel's Binary powers have a specific origin in the comics, and come when Carol absorbs enough energy to emit massively powerful fiery bursts back out of her body. It's Carol's version of the Phoenix, and it'll be interesting to see how she uses her Binary abilities when fighting bigger and stronger villains. Dr. Wendy Lawson haunts and taunts Carol as a form of the Supreme Intelligence. This being is leader of the Kree, and in the comics, its true form is that of a gross floating head with a piercing and perceptive face. Yeah, it looks how you'd imagine the baby of Slimer from Ghostbusters and Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Perhaps we'll see this being in the future, but for now, we'll have to settle on the much more attractive looks of Annette Benning. Kelly Sue DeConnick had a big part to play in Carol Danvers' evolution from Miss Marvel to Captain Marvel. DeConnick is an influential comic book writer who helped shape the Danvers we all know and love. She also had a smaller part in this movie, when she walked past Carol Danvers following the train scene. DeConnick can easily be spotted thanks to her bright red hair and glasses. Another, more acute movie reference comes in the form of the Babe poster hanging in the blockbuster that Carol falls into. And as the Screen Rant article about Captain Marvel Easter Eggs by Andrew Dice argues, Babe is an outsider, a black sheep who wants to be accepted by the other animals and join the farm family. Carol is treated like an outsider, a woman who is both Kree and human, who ultimately finds her place and her true powers. Torfa may sound like some kind of unique vegan food you never knew existed, but it's also the name of the planet that serves as one of the first few set pieces in the Captain Marvel movie. The Skrulls have been hiding out on Torfa as they seek a safe place from the pursuing Kree threat. While it seems to be a good enough headquarters at first, Torfa only gives them trouble as the Skrulls grow sick from the effects of their mining on the planet's vibranium.
The blockbuster scene allowed the filmmakers to cram as many movie references as possible. Another apt reference comes when Carol picks a copy of The Right Stuff up off the shelf. The Right Stuff, which tells the story of astronauts Alan Shepard, Chuck Yeager, and John Glenn, seems to parallel Carol's own journey from Air Force pilot to astronaut before she lands back on Earth. Maybe she'll be able to kick back and watch the movie once Thanos goes bye-bye. Carol Danvers blew up the Asus engine, and the resulting explosion led her to attaining the superhuman abilities she has today. The Asus, which is a hyper-powered, super-fast ship, was actually created by Dr. Philip Lawson, who comes from Captain Marvel's Ultimate Universe storyline in the comics. It's nice to see that the filmmakers were able to amalgamate so many different elements from throughout the character's history. One nice little moment helped expand the universe shown surrounding Carol Danvers in this movie. It also improved a plot hole in the Guardians of the Galaxy films. Some nitpicky fans have complained of James Gunn's choice to make it so that every character throughout the galaxy seems to understand and communicate in English. When Carol tries to talk to the security guard outside the blockbuster, she wonders if he doesn't understand. She also wonders whether her universal translator is working. We can only assume that this universal translator is what the characters use in Guardians of the Galaxy. Carol wears multiple colors throughout her tenure as Captain Marvel in this movie. It's revealed through the course of the film that her suit can change colors as needed. So the different color schemes we see in the movie are perfect representations of past comic book Captain Marvels. The red, yellow, and black were worn by both Marvel and Carol. The white and green color combo matches what Marvel wore when she first arrived on Earth, and the black and silver combo fits Captain Marvel's shield costume. The Kree Star Force are initially played up as heroes and compatriots of Carol. In the comics, the Star Force is a group of supervillains with whom Captain Marvel must do battle. But Yon Rog's group eventually becomes evil, and while their suits match, like many other movie versions of superhero villain teams, their names hew more closely to their comic book counterparts. There's Atlas, Minerva, Bronchar, Korath, and last but not least, Yon Rog. While they don't look as flashy as the individual costumes in the comics, they still cut imposing figures. Stan Lee graces the screen multiple times in Captain Marvel, which manages to pay beautiful tribute to the dearly departed creator of many of your favorite superheroes. Stan Lee appears riding the train, and since this film takes place in 1995, what better than to have Stan Lee reading the script for Mallrats? It was in 1995 that Stan Lee actually cameoed in Kevin Smith's Mallrats, and this Captain Marvel appearance seems to bring his film career full circle. Excelsior, Stan. So, Avengers Endgame, the culmination of 22 movies and 11 years of Marvel Cinematic Universe action has finally hit theaters. And boy does it deliver. It's three hours of pure, unadulterated, and truly epic comic book action. And Marvel Studios really did pack a lot into those three hours. So much was packed into it, in fact, that it was quite easy to miss a lot of those Easter eggs, callbacks, nods, and minor inclusions that the MCU is known for. But never fear, we've got your back. In this video, we'll take you through 30 things you might have missed in Avengers Endgame. And be aware, this one is definitely going to contain Endgame spoilers. Let's start with something that wasn't in Avengers Endgame. That might seem strange, but it's worth pointing out, because for months in the build-up to the movie, fans were assuming that Tony Stark's binarily augmented retroframing, or BARF, God, I gotta work on that acronym. She would play a big part, and they assumed so with good reason, as it was seen written on a prop in a photograph from the movie's set. It was first seen in 2016's Captain America Civil War, but its absence in Endgame just proves that Marvel Studios likes to trick us. We bet you'd probably forgotten that it was strongly expected to appear in the movie. Avengers Endgame opened with the heartbreaking scene of Clint Barton's whole family turning to dust before his eyes on the Barton family's remote farm. Clint's wife is famously played by ER and Scooby-Doo star Linda Cardellini, but less is known about the child actors who portray the couple's kids. It may come as a surprise to you, therefore, to learn that Ava Russo, daughter of Endgame director Joe Russo, played Clint's daughter Lila Barton. She was the girl Clint was training to use a bow and arrow in that opening scene. When we were first reintroduced to Thanos at the start of Avengers Endgame, he was on the same farm we saw him on at the end of Avengers Infinity War, which Nebula confirmed was a place called The Garden. With his mighty golden armor acting as a scarecrow to protect his crops, the Mad Titan was wearing a humble rag, which appeared to be a nod to his simple clothing at the end of the Infinity Gauntlet comic book arc. Although not identical to what Thanos was wearing in the comics, it was certainly similar enough to have quite obviously been influenced by it. 
When the surviving Avengers confronted Thanos the Garden before Thor cut his head off, he also cut his hand off. In case you've forgotten, this is actually a recurring theme in the MCU, with the purpose of it being a nod to Star Wars. If you only knew the power of the dark side. The likes of Bucky Barnes, Aldrich Killian, Ulysses Claw, and Groot have all lost appendages in the franchise. And in Avengers Endgame, Thanos continued that theme. In fact, Bruce Banner also lost the use of his arm when he reversed the snap, so that also continues the theme to a lesser extent. When Steve Rogers was running a support group for Survivors of the Decimation, director Joe Russo's cameo as the MCU's first openly gay man talking about his first date in five years was an easy one to spot. But there was a less obvious cameo in that same scene, in the form of Jim Starlin, who was playing another participant in the group who asked Russo's character about his date. Starlin is a comic book writer and artist, who happens to be responsible for the creation of Thanos, as well as characters like Drax the Destroyer, Gamora, and Shang-Chi. Fans have been speculating about how Paul Rudd Scott Lang would escape the Quantum Realm, since he got stuck in there at the end of last year's Ant-Man and the Wasp, and all was revealed in Avengers Endgame. The Quantum Tunnel van that took him to the Quantum Realm in the first place had been sent to a storage facility in San Francisco, where five years later, a rat activated the tunnel by crawling over some buttons. The number of the specific lockup it was stored in was 616, a reference to the designated name of the main universe in Marvel's comic books. Speaking of that storage facility in San Francisco, the security guard who let Scott Lang out of there was a well-known star in disguise, none other than Ken Jeong. His community co-star, Yvette Nicole Brown, also appeared in Avengers Endgame, but her cameo was more easily identifiable. She was in the elevator with Steve Rogers and Tony Stark back in the 1970s. Rather interestingly, Jeong's character was reading a collection of J.G. Ballard short stories called Terminal Beach. One of the stories within that volume happened to be a little number called Endgame, which is obviously no coincidence. In this year's Captain Marvel movie, and indeed at the start of Avengers Endgame, Brie Larson's Carol Danvers had shoulder-length hair. When Endgame jumps forward five years, and we see Danvers talking to Natasha Romanoff from space via some kind of holographic communication device, she's clearly had a haircut, which she's still rocking when she makes her grand entrance in the movie's epic final battle. If you're not familiar with the comic books, you might be interested to know that it's actually the signature look of the modern Captain Marvel from the source material. In the scene when Natasha was talking to the hologram of Carol Danvers, she was also talking to Rocket, Rhodey, Nebula, and Okoye, all of whom are reporting from their missions. Okoye notably mentioned the fact that there had been a huge seismic activity on the ocean floor, but her plan of action to deal with it was to do nothing, because that wasn't their job. Could this have been a hint at the existence of Namor? We've already seen an Atlantis Easter egg in 2010's Iron Man 2. Maybe Okoye didn't feel the need to deal with ocean issues because she knew Namor would. One of the coolest moments in Avengers Endgame came when Tony Stark arrived at the Avengers compound with the news that he'd figured out time travel. He pulled up in his sports car and was greeted by Steve Rogers, who Tony proceeded to surprise by returning his iconic vibranium shield to him, which he'd taken in 2016's Captain America Civil War. As he handed the shield over, a familiar piece of music played in the background, and that was the theme music from Captain America the First Avenger, Cap's first solo outing in the MCU from back in 2011. Avengers Endgame revealed that the surviving Asgardians had set up a new home in Tonsberg, Norway, called New Asgard. Tonsberg has a history in the MCU. It was the site of the Frost Giant's defeat against Odin's armies, as well as the town where the Red Skull found the Tesseract. In the comics, Asgard has floated above Oklahoma, and in an alternate Marvel Comics universe, New Asgard was the name of a version of Asgard that merged with New York City. So this wasn't a new idea. In fact, it could lead to an adaptation of the epic Siege story arc in the MCU. At the start of Avengers Infinity War, Tony Stark mentioned that Ben and Jerry's had named a flavor of ice cream after him, which Doctor Strange said was rather chalky, prompting Wong to reveal that his favorite flavor was Hulka Hulk Burning Fudge. In Avengers Endgame, in a scene showing some of the remaining Avengers sharing meals, there was a shot of Bruce Banner diving into a massive tub of the dessert, showing that, like Wong, he too is a fan of the Hulk-inspired creation. When Steve Rogers, Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, and Scott Lang traveled back to 2012's Battle of New York, we saw the aftermath of that iconic battle. Rogers entered an elevator with the Hydra Strike team in it, including Brock Rumlow and Jack Rollins. But rather than a repeat of the awesome elevator fight from 2014's Captain America the Winter Soldier, he avoided conflict by whispering Hail Hydra into Jasper Sitwell's ear, pretending to be a Hydra agent. This was a fun nod to the Secret Empire comic book storyline, when Rogers uttered the same phrase to reveal he'd been a Hydra agent all along. 
While they were in New York, the heroes altered the events that occurred there, enabling Loki to escape with the Tesseract. What you might not realize is that there could be repercussions to that in the main MCU. Tony Stark said time travel rules aren't like Back to the Future, so altering the past won't change the main timeline. Yet, when Steve Rogers went back in time, he aged within the main timeline. Essentially, that Loki TV series could still end up taking place in the main MCU timeline. The Stan Lee cameo in Avengers Endgame, which was likely his last one, unless the late great comic book icon filmed one for Spider-Man Far From Home, was particularly joyous. It occurred in the 70s time jump, with Lee playing a de-aged hippie version of himself, driving past the military base with a female friend, proclaiming to them that they should make love, not war. On the back of his car was a bumper sticker that read, Nuff Said, his second most famous catchphrase after Excelsior. The reason for that 70s time jump was so Tony Stark and Steve Rogers could obtain both the Tesseract and some Pym particles in one fell swoop. But given that Rogers would have been recognized at the place called the birthplace of Captain America, he had to wear a disguise. The disguise included a shirt with the word Roscoe on it, which in the comic books was the name of the man who replaced Rogers as Captain America when the hero was going by the name Nomad. While he was at the military base in the 70s, Steve Rogers distracted the young Hank Pym with a prank phone call that made him leave his laboratory in a rush. That allowed Rogers to sneak in and steal a few vials of Pym particles, which would allow him and Tony Stark to return to the present. When the camera panned around inside the lab, just prior to Pym rushing out, we were treated to the sight of an early prototype Ant-Man helmet, which just so happened to be the classic Silver Age Ant-Man helmet from the comic books. Tony Stark got to chat with his father about fatherhood in that same military base scene. And as Howard got in his car at the end of the scene, a certain actor made a very notable cameo. It was James Darcy playing Jarvis, Howard's loyal household butler, reprising his role from the Agent Carter television series. What was particularly notable about this cameo is that in making it, Darcy became the first ever actor whose MCU debut was on the small screen to appear in an MCU movie. The epic final battle in Avengers Endgame began with Steve Rogers, Tony Stark, and Thor confronting Thanos outside the Avengers HQ. And it didn't start too well for the trio. Thanos got the upper hand on the heroes, even breaking Cap's shield in exactly the same way it was broken in Tony Stark's vision in 2015's Avengers Age of Ultron. Thanos also broke the shield in a similar fashion in the Infinity Gauntlet comic book arc, when Rogers stood against him alone. In a movie crammed with epic moments, arguably the most epic came when Captain America finally wielded Mjolnir in the MCU, Thor's original weapon. We'd seen him budget in Avengers Age of Ultron, but most of us just assumed that that was its way of saying you're the closest to being worthy out of everyone. But however, when he summoned it in Avengers Endgame, Thor said, I knew it, which suggests he actually had been worthy all along, and simply chose not to pick it up in Age of Ultron to make Thor feel better about himself. Avengers Infinity War had that cool scene in which Black Widow, Okoye, and Scarlet Witch teamed up against Proxima Midnight, but Avengers Endgame went one better. During the epic final battle, Captain Marvel was trying to get the Infinity Gauntlet into Scott Lang's van, with Spider-Man commenting on how difficult it would be, what with Thanos' whole army in her way. Shuri, Nebula, Pepper Potts, and her rescue armor, Okoye, Valkyrie, Mantis, Gamora, the Wasp, and Scarlet Witch all joined forces to assist her, which is surely a foreshadowing of an all-female MCU team movie in the future. In last year's Ant-Man and the Wasp, Hope Van Dyne smirked sarcastically when Scott Lang referred to Captain America as Cap, suggesting he was great friends with the Avengers leader. There was a funny nod to that scene in Avengers Endgame, when Lang and Van Dyne were tasked with getting the Quantum Tunnel back online during the final battle. Captain America gave them their instructions, and Hope replied, We're on it, Cap, which is followed by her and Scott Lang sharing a meaningful look, followed by a smile. Tony Stark's funeral was a who's who of MCU stars, with everyone from Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne to Maria Hill and General Ross in attendance. But there was also a teenage boy who you might not have realized was an MCU character we were introduced to back in 2013's Iron Man 3, Ty Simpkins' Harley Keener. Simpkins has changed dramatically, so it was very easy to think, who the heck was that? In addition to the likes of Lila Barton and Cassie Lang, Keener's presence in Endgame certainly seems to suggest that young Avengers seeds are being planted in the MCU. 
Following Tony Stark's funeral at the end of Avengers Endgame, Jon Favreau's Happy Hogan, one of Tony's best friends, can be seen sitting with Tony's daughter Morgan outside the Stark family home. Happy asks Morgan if she's hungry, telling her he'll get her any food she wants. When she asks for a cheeseburger, Happy tells her how her father loved cheeseburgers, which is actually a cool nod to the first Iron Man movie from 2008. If you recall, when Tony Stark first arrived home after being held captive in Afghanistan, the first thing he asked for was an American cheeseburger. Thor's future in the MCU was hinted at when Avengers Endgame came to an end, as he joined the Guardians of the Galaxy in their ship, ready to head off into space for more cosmic adventures with Rocket, Groot, and company. The God of Thunder made a pun, calling the team the Asgardians of the Galaxy, which is actually the name of a real team in Marvel's comic books. The roster is very different in the comics. Angela, Thunderstrike, Scourge, the Destroyer, and Throg make up the team. This isn't something anyone would have been able to see in Avengers Endgame, but it's a notable point that you probably missed. You know how Steve Rogers went back in time to place all the Infinity Stones back in the exact places that they were taken from at that exact moment they were taken? In the case of the Soul Stone, that would mean taking it back to the exact moment it manifested on Vormir, which was immediately after Natasha Romanoff's death. So rather horrifyingly, Steve Rogers would have arrived on Vormir to be greeted by the corpse of one of his best friends and his oldest foe, the Red Skull. Just before Steve Rogers went back in time, he told Bucky Barnes not to do anything stupid in his absence. Bucky's humorous reply was to ask him how he could possibly do anything stupid when Steve was taking all the stupid with him. This was actually a cute callback to an exchange that took place in 2011's Captain America The First Avenger, just before Steve met Abraham Erskine for the first time. The only difference was that it was said in reverse, with Bucky telling Steve not to do anything stupid and Steve firing back with the same witty retort. When Steve Rogers went back in time, he was expected to return to the same spot in five seconds. That didn't happen, as Rogers opted to stay in the past with Peggy Carter. But he did return. An elderly Rogers who'd lived happily for more than 70 years with Peggy had made his way to a bench a few yards away, where he handed Sam Wilson his shield in another nod to the comics. He was wearing a tan jacket, which appeared to be the same one he wore when he was still the skinny kid from Brooklyn in Captain America The First Avenger. At the end of Avengers Endgame, we finally got to see Steve Rogers dancing with Peggy Carter. It was a satisfying moment and a fitting end for Captain America's MCU arc. As the happy couple danced, a song was playing that you might have recognized. It was It's Been a Long, Long Time, which was featured in 2014's Captain America The Winter Soldier soundtrack. The song features lyrics that are really appropriate for the situation. And if you're interested, the version that features in Endgame seemed to be the version with Kitty Callan on vocals and the Harry James Band. MCU movies are known for their post credit scenes, and Avengers Endgame was expected to provide us with another. However, there wasn't one, which really felt like Marvel Studios was trying to emphasize the end of an era. But there was something. A clanging noise could be heard, which was actually the noise Tony Stark made when he forged his very first armor in 2008's Iron Man. Essentially, the sound of the Big Bang that launched the MCU. What it meant is anybody's guess. It could just be a respectful nod, or maybe it's hinting that we haven't really seen the last of Iron Man. We all know there's nothing Peter Parker likes better than making pop culture references, but there were tons of references to go around during Spider-Man Far From Home. We'll take a look at all the comic book references, hidden jokes, and Easter eggs we managed to spot during the latest Marvel movie. We'll explain why the name of Peter's Venice Hotel was so important, and why Jake Gyllenhaal playing Mysterio is the perfect casting choice. In the beginning of Spider-Man Far From Home, we see Nick Fury and Maria Hill are investigating the aftermath of a devastating cyclone. Or at least, we see two people who look like Nick Fury and Maria Hill investigating what looks like the aftermath of a devastating cyclone. They walk past a car with a license plate reading 463. The Earth Elemental bears a striking resemblance to the character Sandman, who debuted in the comic book Amazing Spider-Man No. 4, which was released in 1963. Although we know the Elemental is really just a trick played by Mysterio, we still appreciate this obscure comic book throwback reference. As I take people's nightmares and turn them into dream realities. Let's look at another lesser-known inner joke about the film version of the Spider-Man franchise. We all know Tobey Maguire played Peter Parker in Sony's 2002 movie Spider-Man. 
but after sustaining an injury, he threatened to pull out of the sequel unless he received a massive increase in pay. Instead, the studio threatened to replace Maguire with Jake Gyllenhaal, and all of a sudden, Maguire felt like getting back to work. So really, the fact that Gyllenhaal plays Quentin Beck, a villain who wants to take over for Spider-Man and pretend to be a hero, is pretty amazing. I'm not even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> we especially love how much thought and care Mysterio put into his superhero costume, including making sure his cape stays perfectly wrinkle-free. There's nothing like being blipped out of existence and then having to return to high school to damage the old morale. Jason Ionello co-hosts the Midtown School of Science and Technology morning show with Betty Brandt, and to say he's over it is an understatement. While he may not have been putting in his A-game on the school announcements, it's not surprising to those who are familiar with his comic book counterpart. In the comic books, Jason is a member of Flash Thompson's crew of popular kids who really have it out for Peter Parker. But while he likes to bully Peter, he is, of course, a massive fan of the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Brad Davis is another comic book character who appears to be quite different on the big screen. During Far From Home, he competes with Peter Parker for MJ's affections, and for a while he seems to be a serious contender. After all, he's tall, handsome, self-assured, and not trying to balance being a high school student with saving the world. In the comic books, Brad only shows up for a single issue, Amazing Spider-Man number 188. But he does manage to score a date with Mary Jane. Peter and Mary Jane were on a break at the time and had a rather awkward run-in. But don't feel too badly for Peter because it's not like he didn't see anyone while he and MJ were split up. We were on a break! During this time, he was seeing his Daily Bugle co-worker Betty Brandt. Yep, the same character who dates Ned in the movie. In Far From Home, we saw Aunt May working for a charity called Homeless Support Food Shelter Hope. Happy Hogan, perhaps too happily, delivers an oversized check bearing the signature of none other than Tony Stark's widow, Pepper Potts. The charity is supposed to help those who have been displaced as a result of the blip. In the comic books, May Parker takes a job working for a similar charity called Food Emergency Aid, Shelter and Training, otherwise known as Feast. Of course, we're guessing homeless support isn't secretly a front for a criminal enterprise like Feast was, but you never know. During the scene where Happy Hogan delivers the giant check to Aunt May, there's another Easter egg you might not have noticed. Behind Peter, you can see a small poster advertising a fight involving someone named Crusher Hogan. In the comic books, Peter Parker first used his astonishing new spider powers to compete in a wrestling match against a man named Crusher Hogan. Needless to say, this Hogan ended up getting crushed by Spider-Man in the ring. Another poster advertises a match between Crusher Hogan and Bonesaw McGraw. When Peter Parker's story was adapted for the 2002 Spider-Man movie, Crusher Hogan was renamed Bonesaw McGraw in order to avoid audiences confusing Crusher Hogan with real-life wrestler Hulk Hogan. Good move, brother! Of course, we assume Crusher Hogan, Happy Hogan, and Hulk Hogan aren't related, but it's kind of fun to imagine that they are. Peter may have entertained a brief wrestling career in the comic books, but that's not the only sport he's interested in. In the comic books, it was established that Peter and his Uncle Ben enjoyed going to see the Mets play together, and in Far From Home, we spotted a Mike Piazza jersey on display in Peter's room. Although we never got to meet Ben Parker in the MCU, it's nice to know that Peter has fond memories of him. Even the suitcase he packs for his trip bears the initials BFP, after his Uncle Ben. There was actually going to be a scene in Homecoming where May gave some of Ben's old clothes to Peter, but it ended up being cut from the movie. For those of us who have ever witnessed or experienced a high school romance, the summer fling between Betty Brandt and Ned Leeds hit a little too close to home. While it may have seemed to be pretty spontaneous, the two characters do hit it off in the comic books. As we mentioned earlier, Peter and Betty date, but Betty eventually grows frustrated by Peter's constant disappearances and calls it off. She goes on to marry Ned Leeds, who frankly doesn't have much in common with his comic book counterpart. Only time will tell if these MCU characters will go through the same on-again, off-again relationship they do in the comic books. On the class trip where Betty Brandt and Ned Leeds fell in love with one another, they stayed at a hotel called Hotel de Mateus, an unpleasantly moist place located in beautiful Venice. The joke is that the hotel isn't quite a five-star resort, but comic book fans might find the name Demetrius familiar. J.M. Demetrius is a comic book author who has been responsible for some great storylines about notable Marvel characters like Doctor Strange, Namor the Submariner, and of course, Spider-Man. He even wrote the infamous Kraven's Last Hunt storyline featuring one of Spider-Man's most popular villains, Kraven the Hunter. Could this Easter egg be a hint that we could see Kraven incorporated into the MCU? 
Well, probably not, but that's not going to stop us from hoping. We might have also been teased about another classic Spider-Man villain during the movie Far From Home. After Peter gets together with Talos masquerading as Nick Fury, he's introduced to an associate known simply as Dimitri. He might not be the most cheerful guy around, but he seems to get the job done until he pretty unceremoniously disappears and it turns out he was working with Quentin Beck. In the comic books, the very first supervillain Peter fights is named Dmitri Smerdyakov, also known as the Chameleon. He uses costumes and makeup in order to change his appearance to go undercover. In fact, Dmitri is also the half-brother of Sergei Kravenov, better known as Kraven the Hunter. Is Marvel Studios just dropping Easter eggs at this point, or are they giving us hints of villainous things to come? Although we now know the water elemental was just a trick perpetrated by Quentin Beck and his accomplices, he does resemble a real Spider-Man villain known as Hydro-Man. In fact, when Betty and Ned are taking photos in Venice, you can see a boat which says ASM-212. This represents Amazing Spider-Man number 212, which features the debut of Hydro-Man. There's also a scene where Flash Thompson talks about the rumored origin of this creature, which pretty closely mirrors the origin story of Maury Bench, the comic book Hydro-Man. Spider-Man ended up sending him flying off his ship during the testing of an experimental generator. This left him with water-based superpowers and a grudge against Spider-Man. In the comics, Hydro-Man and Sandman combined their powers into a creature called the Mud Thing, which might not be a great name, but it does look like what happened when the Elementals teamed up to attack the Tower Bridge. Marvel Comics have no shortage of awesome villains we'd like to see adapted to fit the big screen. Spider-Man in particular has an impressive rogue gallery, but you might be surprised to know it doesn't contain creatures known as Elementals. This group of characters is comprised of Hellfire, Hydron, Magnum, and Zephyr, and they've never been seen interacting with Spider-Man in any capacity. They are immortal beings who used to rule over all of Earth prior to the rise of Atlantis. But the Illusion Elementals and Far From Home look more like classic Spider-Man villains Molten Man, Hydro Man, Sandman, and Cyclone. During Spider-Man Far From Home, Peter Parker discovers his late mentor Tony Stark left him one last gift. And in true Tony Stark fashion, it's an incredibly dangerous gift he has no business putting in the hands of a high school student. It may look like an unfashionable pair of sunglasses, but it gives him access to an AI known as Edith, which stands for Even Dead, I'm the Hero. Well, at least it's a better acronym than BARF. However, Agent Carter fans may recall a character named Edith Oberon who is romantically involved with Tony's father, Howard Stark. It might be a coincidence that two potentially dangerous beings were both named Edith, or it could be a big screen nod to a small screen series. We know we have to suspend our disbelief to enjoy Marvel movies, but sometimes they take things too far. Honestly, how could anyone think people would be fooled into thinking Spider-Man was another hero just because he was wearing a black costume instead of a red and blue one? It even had the same signature eye holes and everything. Clearly, MJ wasn't tricked by the appearance of Night Monkey even when Peter tried to explain away the webbing by saying maybe he's a spider monkey. But while that does seem crazy, it actually kind of happened in the comic book during the Marvel Apes miniseries. Yes, it's a real thing, and it's just about as crazy as it sounds. There's Spider Monkey who has to work with the Ape Avengers who fight against Dr. Octopus. <laughs> Dr. Octopus. Oh, that's good. During Spider Man Far From Home, we saw Mysterio fool Peter Parker with a series of complex, over the top illusions. Obviously, this is done in the comic books as well, and one even involves a carnival similar to the one we saw in Far From Home. In Amazing Spider-Man number 67, Mysterio tricks Spider-Man into thinking he's been made fun-sized and trapped in a giant carnival where he's at risk of being squashed by Mysterio. See, sometimes it's not that much fun to be a spider. Many of the Far From Home visuals were reminiscent of this issue, including Mysterio's giant hand grabbing a tiny Spider-Man. In Amazing Spider-Man number 218 and 620, Mysterio utilizes drones and robots in a manner similar to the movie version of his character. While Quentin Beck certainly had it out for Tony Stark, he wasn't alone in wanting to besmirch his good name. He led a legion of disgruntled former Stark industry employees, including one who looked very familiar. William Ginter Riva was in the very first Iron Man movie all the way back in 2008. He was the scientist who Obadiah Stane forced to create his Ironmonger suit and forced him to admit that he wasn't quite on Iron Man's level. If you didn't remember this guy, don't feel too badly. Peter Billingsley first appeared on the big screen in the role 11 years ago and was never mentioned until Far From Home. 
He currently holds the record for longest absence in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is kind of a dubious honor. He also holds the honor of playing Ralphie from A Christmas Story. Whoa, really? No way! Confessing your feelings to someone can be difficult, but it's even more challenging when you're hiding a huge secret like being a superhero. When Peter tries to tell MJ how he feels about her, she claims to be confident that he's Spider-Man. But after he admits it, she says that she's really only about 67% sure. In the comic book Amazing Spider-Man Parallel Lives, there was a controversial storyline which revealed that Mary Jane had always known Peter was Spider-Man. Who knows Peter's secret and how long they've been aware has been a hot topic in the comic books, so it's not surprising this was reflected in the movie as well. We all know Quentin Beck is a bad guy, and we have ever since it was confirmed he would be in this movie. That's right, Marvel Studios, you may have fooled Peter Parker, but we knew Mysterio was going to be revealed as a villain at some point. But even for a bad guy, many felt he went way over the line during one specific hallucination. He caused Peter to believe he was in a cemetery near the grave of Tony Stark. We were also treated to a horrifying and heartbreaking Iron Man zombie, which was a pretty low blow. But in the Marvel Zombies series, many of our beloved superheroes did end up being infected with a zombie virus, and Iron Man is indeed one of them. Not only did we get to see the Skrulls back in action for the first time since Captain Marvel, but we heard mention of the Kree as well. Talos slash Nick Fury mentions Kree sleeper cells, which certainly doesn't sound good. This could mean almost anything for the fate of the MCU, but it could have something to do with the Inhumans. In the comic books, the Kree take part in some rather inhumane experiments in an effort to create a genetically superior race. The Inhumans are human-like beings with incredible powers who eventually go on to form their own society. They were also the focus of an incredibly short-lived show, but maybe they'll be incorporated into the MCU at some point in the future. While Peter is incredibly awkward for most of Far From Home, MJ isn't exactly as cool as a cucumber herself. She even admits that she has a hard time getting close to people, but we know pretty much nothing about MJ's background at this point in time. In the comic books, Mary Jane has an abusive father which shapes her life in no small part. We know that the MCU MJ isn't the same as Mary Jane, but it's possible she has a similar sad backstory which could explain why it's hard for her to get close to people. Of course, there are tons of comic book references in Spider-Man Far From Home, but there were also nods to the popular Spider-Man video game for PlayStation 4. One of the features in the game is the ability to take selfies pretty much anywhere at any time. Hey, what more evidence do you need that this is a modern-day Spider-Man than being able to take selfies while swinging through the streets of New York? At the end of the movie, we got to see Peter taking selfies while displaying similar mannerisms and poses to his video game counterpart. MJ might not have been a fan, but we're guessing Spider-Man's other followers will be. It's safe to say that most people love the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but J. Jonah Jameson is definitely not one of those people. He has always hated Spider-Man and views him as a dangerous vigilante. This character has been included in pretty much every adaptation of Spider-Man except for the MCU version up until this point. Not only did we finally get to see J. Jonah Jameson in the MCU, but he was portrayed by none other than actor J.K. Simmons, who also played the character in the Spider-Man franchise directed by Sam Raimi. While J. Jonah Jameson definitely hates Spider-Man, the feeling isn't mutual for the most part in the comics. While Peter Parker clearly has some philosophical differences with the man, he respects his right to his opinions and doesn't blame him for not approving of his extracurricular activities. In fact, while J. Jonah Jameson is out to get Spider-Man, he's often shown to be supportive of Peter Parker. In the comics, Jameson goes from the humble Daily Bugle to the sensationalist fake news network known as the Fact Channel. It's like the Marvel version of Alex Jones and his Infowars, and this is the way he seems to be portrayed in Far From Home. Along with the big reveal of J. Jonah Jameson, we also learn that Mysterio's accomplices have put out the word that Spider-Man is secretly a villain. Footage emerges which seems to show Peter calling for the drone attack on the Tower Bridge, when in reality, he was calling it off. This is actually one of Mysterio's oldest tricks, and he set up Spider-Man as a villain the very first time they met. He even managed to make Peter question whether or not he was a villain and had developed a multiple personality disorder. He even visits a psychiatrist to check out his mental health, but eventually realizes he's been fooled by Mysterio. When we saw the real Nick Fury aboard a spaceship filled with scrolls, we naturally had a ton of questions. But if you haven't kept up with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you might not have noticed that Fury's beach backdrop looked pretty familiar. 
It certainly seems like a reference to Project Tahiti, which was used to revive Agent Coulson after he perished during the attack on the helicarrier in the Avengers. Coulson ended up with some implanted memories of a beautiful beach in Tahiti, which he couldn't help but describe as a magical place whenever it was brought up. Well, these were just a few of the awesome hidden jokes, references, and Easter eggs packed into Spider-Man Far From Home. Fill us in on any we missed and tell us your favorite in the comment section below. Then click on the subscribe button to get access to the latest and greatest videos from us here at Screen Rant. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.